Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is uh, Stacey DeCarma and I work in the sector capacity team here at the Queensland Council of Social Service or QCOS as you probably know us. And it's my pleasure to co-host this event with a few different people today um, who I will introduce in a minute. Um, but before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on today. That's the Yuggera and the Turrbal people. Um, pay my respects to them, their elders, past and present. And I'd all, also like to acknowledge the Durrumbal people um, of, of Central Queensland, on whose land I was born and raised, um, and pay my respects to them and their continuous care for the land that I got to enjoy as a child and as a young adult. Um, I extend that respect to any First Nations people on the line with us today. Um, now this event is um, has been a, a group effort and it's really um, come from the conversations of the Queensland, uh, sorry, the Quality Collaboration Network, um, who meet monthly to discuss many different quality matters and regulatory matters. Um, and that network has been running for quite a few years now. Um, and I have the pleasure of performing a secretariat role within that group. Um, and um, a few months ago now, we were having quite a few conversations about privacy and consent and case notes and quite a few intricate, complex issues that were popping up that we didn't really know the answers to. And it might be that there aren't clear cut answers for many of the questions that we had. Um, but this event, uh, thanks to the historical knowledge of some of our QCN members, um, they reminded me that there was actually an event back, back a few years ago that touched on some of these issues. But since then, we've had quite a few different changes to the Human Services Quality Framework. We've had the introduction of the Human Rights Act, and we've had quite a few different aspects that influence our decision making around privacy, consent, and information security. And we thought it was worthwhile to revisit um, those topics. Um, and I think we were right to think to revisit it because we've had a huge number of registrations for this event, which is uh, great because it shows that there's um, this is really meeting a gap in and um, um, creating a space for a conversation that you would all like to have, which is fantastic. Um, now, if you would like to ask a question, there is a QA and a function down the bottom of your screen. We have muted uh, you, so if you would like to use your microphone and ask a question, please feel free to take yourself off mute and um, ask your question. Uh, there's a lot of content to get through today, um, and the intent of this event today is not to comprehensively unpack absolutely everything around privacy, consent and information security, or else we will be here for many days. Um, this, the intent of today really is to provide a springboard for conversations that we will continue having in the coming months and in, into the new year. The QCN has quite a few different um, plans to pursue different topics via meetings, via lunchbox sessions and different events. So lots of opportunities to keep having these conversations. Um, and today really is just the beginning of that. Um, now, there is one speaker who isn't able to join us today. Um, Lindsay from Peak Care um, sends his apologies. He said they had, had something urgent come up. He's just not able to join us, but he has really kindly offered to um, put together some of the resources he was going to share today and send it through to us so that we can share with all of you. So if you were coming along today really wanting to get some information around children's perspectives and case note writing, particularly um, when it involves families, uh, you will get that information, maybe not uh, all of your questions answered today, but we will get some of that information to you as soon as we can. Um, and Lindsay really um, was disappointed that he wasn't able to be on the line today. Um, obviously, Lindsay's from Peak Care, and we have our lovely Rebecca here. You might be able to see her on the screen at the moment. She's joined me from Peak Care and is going to assist with hosting today. So Rebecca's going to say a little bit more about herself and Peak Care as an organisation um, when uh, she introduces the Youth Advocacy Centre. So uh, I don't think I've got any, Maria, do I have anything else that I need to say about housekeeping at all? I'm just referring to our lovely events officer who's sitting next to me. No, just if there are any questions to pop in the Q&A. Yes. Well. Just pop any questions in the Q&A function. We'll do our best to get to your questions. Some of you did submit questions uh, during the registration process, which is fantastic because we've been able to think about those. Um, but if something comes up for you, just 
pop it into the Q&A box um, and happy for you to use the chat function for discussion as well. We'll do our best to keep an eye on all of those moving parts as we go along. We have got a break built into the, uh, because we know we're keeping you online for a while, that can be tricky, um, but we will have a little bit of a break um, in between some of the sessions. So there will be a chance to grab a drink, go to the toilet, do those kinds of things um, throughout the, the um, event today. Okay, so I'm going to introduce now um, our first uh, speaker, who is Tim Wilson. Um, Tim is a director in the investment and commissioning team at the Department of Children, Youth Justice and Multicultural Affairs, a role he has held for the last six years. In that time, he has overseen the role of new investment in the family support system and the establishment of various other initiatives such as the Family Participation Program. Tim has worked in the department for 27 years in various regional and central office roles, mostly involved in managing the department's investment in the non-government sector. In the dark ages, prior to that, <laughs> Tim worked in the non-government youth sector in Brisbane and Logan. And I just want to put a disclaimer that that's not my joke, that's Tim's own joke. <laughs> um, over to you, Tim. Tim's got some great information to share with us um, regarding some of the systems that the department uses. Um, and I really want to thank Tim for his time and willingness to be part of the conversation today. It's really useful. Um, over to you, Tim. Okay. Thanks, Stacey, and really pleased to be here. I'm, I'm sure there are people online who I am um, aware of or who work in the services that use the ARC system. So the questions that um, I've been asked to address have been specifically around the advice referral and case management system that's used by um, the services we fund under the new child and family investment. So that includes Family and Child Connect, um, Intensive Family Support, Family Wellbeing Services, Assessment and Service Connect and Family Participation Program, which is a, um, a program that's targeted at supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families to have uh, input into decisions in the child protection system that involve their children. So ARC is based on the Info Exchange SRS platform. I know a lot of people in the sector have been using SRS based systems for a long time, and a lot of you will be familiar with the, the outline of the SRS platform. It was developed in consultation with the services funded under those programs. And like any system, it's never perfect when you first start rolling it out. So we have worked with the sector quite closely to try and continue to make refinements to the system. Um, so that better meets the needs of providers. Um, we've tr tried to make sure that organizations using the system can draw data out um, from it about their own service delivery so that they can do their own planning um, as well as you know use it to enter their case notes. So in terms of the system, it provides uh, a way for providers to receive and send referrals. Um, it supports them undertaking and recording their client assessments and recording case plans and notes. Uh, it also has functionality to support providers to do their quarterly reporting to the department. So it generates the reports that then get fed into our shiny new P2I system um, so that they can satisfy our needs around um, reporting. Um, I need to stress it was deliberately set up at arm's length from the department. So people in the department never access case records in ARC. Um, we did that um, very deliberately to make sure that clients accessing those services that are all voluntary services um, can, be, can do that confident that the department can access their personal information. So service providers using the system enter their case notes in there, knowing that um, the department doesn't access those records. Um, when they're working with families, they do provide information to clients um, about how their information will be stored and recorded, and they try and make it as clear as possible that uh, the service providers record information that isn't accessible to the department. We do extract aggregate data from the system, um, so it's non-identifying and it uh, really provides information about how the system and how services are operating. And we use that to do system planning and review. Um, so we produce these quite detailed aggregated reports that go to our stakeholder, our statewide implementation groups for those various programs. Um, they show patterns of performance by different providers uh, across the state. And we've been doing that since the program commenced. So for the last five or six years, we've got data sets that show how agencies are going in terms of uh, patterns of referrals, consent rates, 
the presenting issues at times we've looked at that, um, the types of responses offered by service providers um, and the outcomes achieved by clients in terms of rates of case closure. Uh, we also can pull out ad hoc um, data requests from that system so that, you know, if there's, for, for instance, the statewide implementation group is interested in looking at patterns of consent, we can run a particular report that gives us that data and we share that with agencies across the state. Um, it's also set up so that service providers themselves can pull out aggregate data so that they can uh, get a sense about how their service delivery is looking. Um, they can look at um, work by individual caseworkers. They can um, track how effectively they're providing their own services. So, you know, that aggregate data um, reporting function, we hope it is useful to service providers. And we do know that a number of them do use that function quite a lot. Uh, I know people have concerns about who has access to information in ARC. Um, so as I said at the start, we client, uh, people in the department don't have access to individual client records in ARC. That aggregate data is used by staff in my area, the investment and commissioning area. Um, and we have a performance reporting and analysis team, which produces a lot of the data reports that sit on the our performance website alongside a lot of child safety data. Um, so they're responsible for our corporate reporting. They draw the aggregate data out in the same format that we do, and they do they manipulate that data in ways that um, gives us an indication about how effective services are being, but um, it doesn't give us any information that's identifying for clients. Um, we do share those data reports uh, with our regions, um, but we don't, uh, again, regional staff don't, have, don't access the raw ARC data there is some data matching that occurs between ARC and ICMS, the Department's Client Management System, but it occurs within very tightly controlled circumstances. And it's really used just to enable um, the identification of children escalating from the secondary service system to the child protection system. We use that data um, to really demonstrate that intervention by family support service reduces the likelihood of um, children coming to the attention of the child protection system. And so we've used that data uh, in making the case to Treasury for um, extension of the funding and to, to justify the investments making in family support services. And really the data is showing that um, more than 90% of the children who are assisted through family, secondary family support services don't become subject to a child protection notification within the following six months. The matching that occurs is undertaken by three staff who don't sit in an area that's in any way related to service delivery or even service commissioning. Those, they extract the demographic details of a child um, and then see if there is a current case record in ICMS for those children. They have an algorithm to match the data and they produce an aggregate report so it doesn't identify any of the children um, who are matched in ARC. Um, and then that raw matching data is destroyed. So what anybody who has any in involvement in the child protection system sees is a report that just says this proportion of children who are supported by this service or this by services in this region or at a statewide level um, were did did come or didn't come to the attention of the child protection system in the following six months. Any of that? It's got a message that recording. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, really do need to emphasize that the people in the department can't access um, client case files in ARC. So people can be confident when they're providing their information to a family support service that um, nobody in here is accessing that data. Um, there was another question around uh, the, the need for agencies to produce um, printouts from, of ARC data when they're subpoenaed. Um, by the department um, and the ways that ARC does that reporting. And, and there are times that the department will seek information from a family support service about a family they're working with. Um, there's a variety of points in the system where that might occur. So there might be a pre-notification check when a, a regional intake service is making a decision around whether a case that they're seeing should be um, something that the department investigates or if it should be really referred on to a family support service, they may contact the service provider and ask if the family is engaged um, with the family, uh, with the, sorry, if the service provider is engaged with the family. 
there might be uh, an affidavit during an INA process. So the department's carrying out an investigation, seeks information or a, an affidavit from the, the service provider. That doesn't rely on a printout of information held by the service provider. It's really um, caseworkers' impressions of the family or concerns about what's going on in the family. Um, and then finally, if there's a court hearing, um, the department may subpoena information that's held by uh, a family support provider. And it's only in that latter case that um, we may require an ARC record to be extracted. Um, the way ARC is structured, I mean, it does rely on a case being created, a case record being created around a child with a family member attached. There is some flexibility in how um, people connect that case record to individual family members. So for example, if a, a child is living with the mother um, and the father's living in a separate household, um, the service can uh, decide that they want to um, set up that case summary in a way that um, information about the father is recorded in the father's case record, rather than having it attached to the child and family's case record. Um, I'm not a technical expert on how ARC works, but I'm, I understand that is the way it's created. So there is some flexibility to be able to create case records in a way that if it does, if a printout does occur, it doesn't necessarily have to contain a lot of identifying information or, or personal information around all of those family members. I'll probably leave it at that. I mean, I think that responds to most of the questions that people ask, but I'm happy to take any questions from people. Uh, thank you. We have echoes. So much, Tim. Okay, still echoing. Monica, perhaps if you mind the question. Okay, how's that? That's better. Yep. Thank you. That's, um, I'm so pleased I don't have to mime. It's way too early for that. <laughs> uh, and uh, I just want to thank you very much, Tim. That was really a useful overview. We have, um, we're tracking well for time. So if anybody does have questions uh, for Tim, please uh, raise your hand or put them in the chat. Wow, Tim, looks like you're, um, you're getting off scot-free. It was obviously a really comprehensive uh, introduction to ARC. Right. Yeah, you left no stone unturned. Yep. That's right. Uh, we, um, we'll just keep an eye on the chat and um, okay. uh, you're going to stay on the line, I think, for a little yes. bit. So uh, Tim is available if uh, questions do come to mind for people. I uh, want to also uh, say hello to everybody on the line and uh, just let everybody know that unfortunately Stacy has had to uh, leave us um, because of a childcare situation that is um, uh, breaking news unfolding right now. So she sort of sends her apologies as she's had to dash out the door. Um, in her absence, I think I might just um, do a bit of a shout out to Stacy because she's done such a terrific job in getting uh, this particular forum up and running, uh, but all of her energy uh, with the Quality Collaboration Network, it's just gone from strength to strength. And I know that there are people on the line who um, are very much part of the Stacey Dukama fan club. So um, well done, Stacey. Hopefully this makes you squirm when you read back on the recording. Uh, the next presenter is actually uh, me. So I uh, will share my uh, screen and get going in a minute. Uh, before I do that, though, I just thought because my um, uh, topic is going to be really grounded in, in uh, human rights and privacy. 
but I wanted to sort of uh, tap everybody uh, in the chat to just have a quick think about what privacy means to you personally. And what do you think it means to the clients that you work with? If anyone's brave enough to just pause for a little minute and put in some uh, thoughts in the chat, I think that would be a really great way to kick off this session. And I'm going to share my screen while that happens. All right, I'm just going to check the chat while I'm doing this. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Gail, about building trust. Absolutely. You're in charge of disclosure. Deeply personal. Dignity and respect. Those human rights concepts are really coming through. And that's a really important point that Melissa makes. It's not just about records, but it's also about space. Obviously, consent, front and centre, when we're talking about privacy, if there's no consent. Yes, going to the purpose for which the information is being requested and not for any exterior purpose. Wonderful. Yep. Without privacy, it's the heart of what we do, the reasons our client come back. That's great, that touches on the trust issue. Yes, it is different for everybody. And the right to choice. Thank you so much. That's really terrific, everybody. I'll keep uh, monitoring that as we go through. All right, so... That's such a really good way to start because um, it may come as a surprise to people that uh, actually um, there is no common law right to privacy in Australia. The, the law, the judge made law doesn't actually recognize um, a, a right to privacy at all. So in the absence of that, uh, the legislature and our parliaments have turned to creating law through, through statute. Now, this first slide is horrendous. I do apologise, there's way too much information on it. Uh, but before we dive into human rights, what I thought would be useful uh, for everybody is just to give a little bit of a scene setting exercise about where human rights legislation fits in the context of other information privacy legislation. Because the Human Rights Act is, you know, still a, it's, it's still our baby. It was only uh, introduced a couple of years ago and we've only just come to the end of its first year of operation. But we do have privacy laws that precede uh, its enactment. And uh, you can see in Queensland, the information privacy legislation has been around since 2009. But at a federal level, we've had privacy law since 1988. Now, all of these uh, pieces of legislation arise from those human rights principles that all of you just recognised um, in the chat there. So it's the international instruments that Australia has signed up to that have given rise to our parliaments putting those laws and those obligations and concepts actually into domestic legislation. Uh, later on in today's session, we're going to hear from Professor John Swinson from the University of Queensland. And John's really going to focus on uh, the privacy principles that govern federal and also the Queensland legislation. I'm not going to go into any of that detail now, but just so that you know, the uh, 
the uh, obligations around collection, storage and security, use and disclosure of personal information, those obligations come from those enabling pieces of legislation. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, unpacking of that material that is going to happen a little bit later. The other thing that this slide hopefully does uh, is just give you a sense that um, the regulation of privacy obligations kind of looks a little bit similar, depending on whether we're looking at human rights um, or the Information Privacy Act. So uh, we have uh, regulatory bodies that uh, have powers and functions to make sure that privacy um, principles are being applied correctly, proportionately for the purpose that we collect the information. Um, there are complaints mechanisms for human rights, but also um, here in Queensland, we have um, our Office of the Information Commission and our Privacy Commissioner, and there's a complaints process there. And in fact, there's more of a complaints process under that um, uh, uh, complaint mechanism than there is really uh, under the human rights um, legislation. There's no appeal if you um, uh, get to the end of having a complaint conciliated under human rights. But let's get a little bit more into it and have a look at the right to privacy that we now can celebrate um, its inclusion in the Queensland Human Rights Act. Alrighty, so when we um, think about um, the human rights that are engaged in Queensland under human rights law, we really can think about section 25. So the first thing to mention about uh, this section is that the scope of the right is actually really broad. And if you look at that language and those words that are bolded, it is far broader than uh, the wording in the information privacy legislation. So it extends to, obviously it, collect, it, it, it captures personal information and data collection, but it extends to a person's private life more generally. So it protects the individual against interference with their physical and their mental integrity. And that can include their appearance, their clothing, their gender, their sexuality, and their home. The project that I work on here at QCOS is focused on housing and homelessness service provision. There is no right to adequate housing in the human rights legislation. So the fact that home is captured in this right in the Human Rights Act is a really, really important thing when we're talking about people's integrity and their private life. Um, and their ability to stay in their, in their place of residence. The reference to family in the, um, uh, in the section is also broad and it recognises that family takes many forms. So it's not just one's nuclear family, but it extends to how various social and cultural groups in Queensland uh, define for themselves that right to um, their understanding of family. Importantly, um, the right protects the privacy of people from unlawful or arbitrary interference. So arbitrary, uh, something can be perfectly lawful, but it can still be arbitrary. And we'll have a look at a couple of cases to see what that really means in practice. But when we think about things that are capricious, unpredictable, disproportionate use of, um, uh, of information or policies that go beyond the real reason and purpose for why we're doing something, that's when we get into uh, the arbitrary sort of terrain. Now, although um, the right to privacy is, you know, broadly defined and expressed, and that's something that we can certainly champion. 
uh, it typically fares pretty poorly when it's balanced against other competing rights and interests. So the right sits as one of 23 protected rights under our legislation and it doesn't exist in isolation in any way whatsoever. All of our rights are inherent. We have them whether or not we're granted them under, under legislation. That's not how that works. They are inherent to us um, and they are all interrelated. But necessarily, we, um, we have to engage in a bit of a balancing act. And I know that through the work that everyone um, on the line does, that the promotion and protection of other human rights, when weighing up against the right to privacy, uh, those other human rights are likely to be, um, be weighed more, more strongly and come out as being preferred. So it's very rare that the right will be engaged in isolation. It's often engaged um, alongside other rights, such as the right to protection of families and children in the housing context um, and the right to freedom of movement. Let's just have a think about where um, the right to privacy is going to be engaged in the work that we do. Uh, you all represent different uh, services and are doing really different work on a daily basis. I know a lot of people are working with children, for example. Um, please uh, just pop into the chat um, the, the issues that you're grappling with, perhaps, and where you think the right to privacy is um, most engaged or often engaged. I know that it um, regularly comes up in the context of um, people exercising any kind of discretion in a resi care setting um, to inspect rooms, for example, to have um, a locked environment. We've been working with a domestic and family violence service and a women's shelter uh, out, out west and the use of CCTV footage in that uh, service obviously gives rise to a limitation on the right to privacy. Yep, sharing information to support case, case planning and casework, room inspection. Thanks guys. Uh, it can also be engaged in mental health settings and medical settings where someone has um, medical examinations or might be uh, required to go through routine drug or alcohol tests. And yes, um, sharing of information, of course. All right, now this is um, information that we should all be coming very familiar with. It should be able to be rolling off our, off our brains now in our daily work. Um, because we, yeah, that's a really good one. Thanks, Alison, in relation to the management of drugs um, and risk management procedures. Um, because we work in organisations that uh, are in receipt of government funding to deliver that service, uh, we are a public entity. And um, obviously, you know, Tim is working at the department. The department is a core public entity. So this obligation to uh, act compatibly with human rights, and if you can't do that, give pro proper consideration to a person's human rights whenever you're making a decision, taking an action, applying a policy, writing your policies, um, uh, that is now the legal obligation that we work under in addition to and alongside um, any of those obligations in information privacy legislation. Thanks, Lizzie. Yes, I'm just checking the chat, everybody. Um, children's counselling, sharing information with parents when children do not consent. That is a fantastic um, comment there. I should say that I, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be answering all of these uh, here and now, but all of our other speakers are on the line and uh, they are also monitoring the chat. And so what we can hopefully do is address some of these comments as we go through.
Yep. Thanks, Joanne. Yep. Counselling. Okay. Uh, now, look, I'm really confident that people are getting used to this idea of giving proper consideration when rights are going to be limited. Um, rights are limited every day uh, to, to, to be sort of, you know, real and frank about it. Um, we can't um, act compatibly with these human rights in everything that we do. There are necessarily going to be limitations um, and uh, room inspection is one of them and you guys are you're identifying all of those issues through the chat. So being very clear about the purpose for, um, uh, for what it is that you are going to do is really, really important at the outset. The slide that you're just looking at now is a bit of a four-step process that we are developing through this particular project to hopefully make things um, easy for people when they give proper consideration. Step three, obviously we identify the rights that are going to be engaged in the decision that we're going to take. So let's, for example, think about inspection of rooms. Yes, the right to privacy is, um, uh, is a right that would be engaged. If the purpose for doing that is safety and security of other people, um, then those rights too are going to be engaged in that action. Then we need to think about the compatibility of what, what it is we are about to do before we do it. So we think, well, is a room inspection lawful? Yes, of course, we are, we are allowed to do that. We're not um, illegally searching a room. Um, uh, is what we're going to do achieve the purpose for, for, for what it is we're doing? Is it the least restrictive way to achieve that purpose? And is it fair and balanced? Is what we're going to do going to have uh, a net benefit rather than cause harm to people? And the greater an incursion on human rights uh, that might happen when we, when we make a decision that's going to limit human rights, the more important it will be for us to clearly record and justify the decision that we are making. So risk management is a perfectly acceptable reason to do that work for the safety and security of other residents, um, for the safety and security of staff. But documenting that becomes very important, uh, particularly when we look at some of the decisions uh, that have been made um, about this particular right. So at the moment in Queensland, we don't have much case law um, specifically on the right to privacy, but we can look to uh, our interstate counterparts for some uh, jurisprudence because they've been at this game a little bit longer and their privacy section in their uh, legislation is pretty similar to ours. So this, this case uh, is a 2013 uh, case. Beth was um, a child at the time that the decision was made uh, with uh, impairment and uh, a really uh, big history of um, sexual abuse. She had been removed as a baby um, from her birth parents and had, had been moved around a lot. So she had quite <clears throat> um, complex behaviours and the Supreme Court of Victoria was asked to determine whether um, the, the limitation on her human rights to liberty, privacy, and freedom of movement, uh, whether that was necessary and proportionate um, <clears throat> to keep her safe. So she was uh, um, uh, subjected to restrictive interventions, um, but those interventions were very carefully limited in the duration. Um, there, were, there was a requirement that progress reports were going to be regularly provided and there was going to be ongoing independent supervision of that order. So the court ultimately decided that, yes, those limitations of your human rights were necessary proportionate and therefore um, lawful in that context. Uh, it's a lengthy but really illuminating decision. And if anybody is working in um, out of home care, it might be uh, of interest to you. So when these slides are shared, you can go and have a look at the case for yourself. Um, a slightly different case, and I'll just run through this quickly. 
another Victorian one, and this is very recent, uh, a different example, um, uh, Mr Minogue was in, was a prisoner at the time and he was um, subjected to random drug and alcohol tests and strip searches. Uh, and when the court looked at how those tests were conducted, um, it quite um, sternly decided that they were not compatible with the right to privacy and the right to be treated humanely and with dignity um, in detention. So in that situation, there was no, um, uh, it, the, the tests were, all, were lawful. They arose from uh, policies and directions under the corrections legislation, under the Enabling Act in Victoria. Uh, but human rights weren't considered before the tests were uh, required and conducted. And there were less restrictive ways that they could have um, conducted that testing that corrections officers didn't do. Um, and also the fact that um, uh, Mr Minogue had no history of drug use. So he had uh, the, the reason for doing it um, just did not seem to stack up in that situation. Uh, I've just got a couple of slides to go and then I'll wrap up folks. Um, I just wanted to um, flag that any uh, legal disclosures that are required or prohibited by law um, will um, take precedence in, in the context of information privacy legislation and the Human Rights Act. So neither of those two pieces of legislation are going to override provisions that mandate or prohibit disclosure. Uh, also that there are um, useful, there's useful practice about information sharing between agencies um, through the use of documented uh, agreements and memorandums of understanding. Um, the Privacy Commissioner has information about conducting privacy impact assessments. Uh, there's a whole range of fact sheets um, that the Privacy Commissioner has developed that um, are, are useful and clear in, in that regard. And that there are some, I guess, innovations on foot. Stacey shared with me that at the last time this, this particular forum was being held uh, was in 2017. And that's obviously when the information sharing guidelines under the Domestic and Family Violence Prevention Act uh, came into play. So um, those uh, information sharing arrangements are actually uh, enshrined in law. Um, and also just people may be familiar with the, uh, the one stop one story uh, innovation. That's a pilot program that's actually being rolled out at the moment. It was launched last month. And if people aren't familiar, maybe that's something that we could discuss in a future uh, QCN. Uh, just final slide, just in terms of uh, how we might weave human rights into our policies and procedures. Uh, through this project, we have reviewed a number of organisational policies and procedures and some observations that we uh, can make and share with everybody is that it's very easy and possible to modify policy language to become more rights respecting and doing that very explicitly uh, can position service users as rights bearers and that can usefully filter through to the cultural build in organisations when we start talking the language of human rights. Uh, really documenting proper consideration and justifying those decisions is super important. Um, many of you, I think, do already have dedicated human rights policies to anchor that practice. Also not lo losing sight of the fact that the Human Rights Act sits above policies and procedures. So that is a lawful requirement now that we give consideration to human rights and that staff really appreciate concrete examples um, because that can make it real for them. Um, and all those examples are in the chat, um, which I um, might just check now. Just one more time. Oh, okay.
Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. That was uh, a bit of a whistle stop tour of uh, human rights legislation in Queensland. Um, and that's my presentation done. I'm going to uh, mute myself and, oh, thanks, Joanne, uh, and hand over to my colleague to my left, Beck. Okay. 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 Is that fixed? <laughs> okay, I hope that has helped. Okay, can everyone, can you hear me? Is that fine? Can you hear me now? All right. Just wanted to thank Monica um, for her presentation um, as well as Tim. And um, there are a few more chat things that have come through. I want to say thank you, Monica. Um, okay, so um, we're going to move on to our next session, um, which is being presented by YAC or the Youth Advocacy Centre um, around confidentiality and youth is the law. Um, so we're joined by Katrina Jefferson and Leanne Hoyer. And I'll just, uh, I guess, give you a bit of information about Leanne and Katrina. So Leanne has been employed at the Youth Advocacy Centre for over 20 years. Uh, Leanne's current role is coordinator youth court support programs. Uh, Leanne graduated from Queensland University of Technology with a Bachelor of Social Science in Human Services. Um, she has a passion for working with young people and has worked in the youth and community service sector in direct practice for over 25 years. Uh, Leanne has particular expertise for, in working with and advocating for homeless and unsupported young people in relation to broad range of legal issues. Leanne's experience has led her to work in a variety of service settings, including the community, the public sector and Texas juvenile probation in the United States. Uh, this grounded experience has also led Leanne to undertake a range of project work, including a collaborative project where she was instrumental in researching, consulting and developing a service model for young women who are homeless and or experiencing sexual violence, um, which is known today as the Centre for Young Women, which is located here in Brisbane. Uh, Leanne has the opportunity to share her knowledge on a range of state reference groups. Um, she's also an accredited trainer and has expertise and experience in developing and delivering training on youth work practice within a legal framework. Um, and Katrina, so Katrina has been the Community Legal Education Officer at YAC for over eight years, and her role includes presenting legal information sessions to young people aged between 10 and 18, including at schools, youth services and youth detention centres and alternative education centres. Developing resources on new and emerging legal topics impacting young people, co-presenting the Laying Down the Law Youth Worker Training alongside YAC's Youth Support Advocate. Um, and prior, prior to joining YAC, uh, Katrina worked as a lawyer in the Queensland Government in a variety of roles. She practiced as a criminal lawyer for over 15 years at the Director of Prosecution's Office, prosecuting serious offences in the High Courts and at Legal Aid Queensland, representing clients in the Magistrates Court. Katrina has worked as a senior lawyer at the Crime and Corruption Commission, investigating police misconduct, the Department of Education, advising school staff and departmental officers on matters of administrative law and misconduct, and the Department of Communities, Child Safety Services, developing child protection legislation. Katrina was admitted as a barrister in 1988 and has therefore been a lawyer for almost as long as Home and Away has been on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so I will leave it to you guys to um, yeah, share with us your information. Thank you.
Great, excellent. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, before we start, uh, Leanne and I would like to acknowledge the traditional um, custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to um, elders past, present, and the young people who are going forward to lead their communities in the future. And we're just trying to write get this <laughs> happening. So um, <clears throat> you'll see this um, when we provide the PowerPoint later on, but we've just put up that, um, that little brochure, which explains a bit about YAC services for those of you who aren't familiar with um, what we do. Um, <clears throat> just some little quick messages. Um, about how young people have traditionally been viewed by society. Um, things haven't changed a great deal over the millennia. So people have often viewed young people as a source, adults in particular have viewed uh, young people as a source of vexation and trouble um, and expected sometimes perhaps more of the young people than the adults are prepared to, to put in in terms of supporting young people, particularly those who are disadvantaged. So our philosophy at YAC is that we look at the young person holistically, we look at what's going on in their life, and we try and support them in the various areas that they, that they need and are seeking that help and support. Um, we are a legal as well as a welfare service, so we have uh, lawyers who are regularly appearing in court for young people who are um, in the criminal justice, in the youth justice system, and um, not unsurprisingly, perhaps a proportion of those young people are also engaged with the child protection system. Uh, the presentation we've got today is um, contains some of the content from our laying down the law youth worker training. Um, so you you will sort of be enmeshed a little bit in some legal concepts. We hope that that doesn't overwhelm people too much. Um, and just a, a disclaimer that Leanne and I are not familiar Zoomers, <laughs> so um, we may be a little bit challenged by this format. We're used to having a room full of speak new room full of people to speak to, and um, luckily for us, we've been able to do you know some of that you know, over the last couple of years, notwithstanding current circumstances. Uh, so <clears throat> one of the touchstones for our organisation, because we are a rights-based organisation, is the uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Did you want to speak to that one, Leanne? No? Okay, cool. Yeah. So basically, um, the United Nations Convention is the most agreed convention um, that's come out of the UN. Australia is a signatory. Um, interestingly, an Australian actually wrote the, much of the content of the document, which is worth reading holistically if you're inclined, although we will talk about a couple of the principles that we think are relevant to today's discussion. Um, so essentially, it confirms that children are um, human beings and therefore they're deserving of all uh, the human rights that other people, adults enjoy. Um, and we say that essentially um, it's a minimum, it sets a minimum stand in relation to how um, in particular governments should respond uh, in terms of supporting and caring for um, the children um, under their auspices. Um, and in particular, these couple of, of, of messages are clear that um, governments need to be sensitive to the particular needs of children in relation to providing services to them in, around supporting their healthy development. The governments have an obligation in terms of protecting children from abuse and exploitation by adults. Um, and that children do have the right to participate in decisions that affect them. Um, there is a nice little YouTube clip, so when you get the, the printout, you can have a look at that. We won't play it today <clears throat> because of time constraints, but that's a nice little clip which unpacks um, the, the convention pretty much in its entirety, um, setting out all of the, uh, the rights that young people have and the responsibilities that governments have around those rights. So Article 12 is just one we'd like to draw your attention to, which is that um, children it's recognised that children are capable of forming their own views and their opinions, and that they have the right to express those, um, particularly when decisions are being made by government, um, which will impact those children individually. Um, you'll see that we've referenced here, that the article references that um, the age and maturity of the child will play into um, the weight that may be given, particularly by government, um, two statements made by young people when they're involved in administrative or legislative or court processes um, where the government is the protagonist. So we won't talk about the Human Rights Act because that's been really fulsomely unpacked by Monica. <laughs> so thank you for that, Monica. Um, but we will talk a little bit about um, our framework for decision-making because 
um, I suppose it sets the scene a bit in terms of where we see confidentiality in young people um, um, and the fact that there is um, an interlacing, I guess, of, of that legal concept alongside other legal concepts um, with the practicalities of in particular youth work and the impacts that decisions made by organisations will have on young people. Um, yeah, so I, I think the first important thing um, as workers we should be thinking about when we're working with young people and when we call our decision decisions, we, we're talking about responses and actions and support we provide, we really need to be really clear about where we're making that decision from. Um, because often I think um, we think we're making a decision because a law says we should do something a certain way when in fact it might not actually, um, it might be silent on, on, what, on what we should be doing. And so as workers, we're then drawing on what we call moral, <laughs> moral frameworks. And some of that stuff is around what our organisations might, policies and procedures might say, or what our professional or personal um, frameworks might say. And so oh, we've just put an example up there in terms of um, hopefully to highlight some of the stuff we're trying to um, talk about. If the law doesn't compel you to give police certain information about a young person, the decision to do so will depend on your moral stand. So that's a personal perspective, which are values, biases, which we all have, <laughs> um, and boundaries or professional frameworks, which are our standards, professional ethics and good practice our, or what's in our service agreements in terms of the organisation policies and procedures we might be working to. When we talk, so, so basically, what does the law say? What does our organisation say? And what does our, um, sorry, I'm just gonna go to the next one. So what does the law say? And when we talk, when we talk about the law, we're talking about, about a whole lot of legal frameworks, which we're not gonna have a lot of time today to talk about. Today, we're gonna to talk about confidentiality, but we, when we say what the law says, we, we as workers are thinking about um, negligence, which the sector sometimes say that's the duty of care stuff. Really what we're talking about is negligence. Um, duty of confidentiality, which we will talk about, about today. Competency and what are quasi-legal considerations. And they're things that um, Katrina briefly mentioned, like the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So the first one is, what does the law say? The second is, what does my organisation say? So they're policies and pre <laughs> procedures. Um, in terms of what we work under. And we all work within different processes and policies and procedures, um, which means that your clients have to navigate that. They have to navigate not only in terms of what possibly legislation says, if there isn't, then what, what as an organisation, that organisation may do or respond to in a certain way. And so... Um, some of the things there that are really important to think about are information sharing, for instance, within your organisation, what policies and procedures you might have there, external, um, externally in terms of other agencies, in terms of what are your processes and policies there, and um, such things as, for example, reporting um, suspected um, um, abuse or neglect. So the third thing is the personal and professional framework, which are ethics um, and standards that we might operate within, but also our personal biases. And we all have those. I'm not sure if this is going to work here, but we will try um, with, in terms of like a hands up in terms of if you feel like if you have a client in front of you, um, that you need to know, for example, a young person's offending history to effectively support them. How many people think that in terms of the way that they work? I'm just a sure. hands up. Just hands. <laughs> I'm not sure if we can see any of that. Um, possibly not. Um, all right, so we might just <laughs> we might just keep going. So I, I guess what we're trying to do is highlight that every worker will have a different stance on things. If the law is silent, if your organisation policy and procedures are silent, then it comes down to our professional personal biases. Um, 
So another one would be, for instance, confidentiality should be maintained at all times. And every worker would have something a little bit different in terms of what that might look like. When we're talking about, for instance, stealing a pen from the news agent, that might not be something that like, for example, workers think that they need to breach confidentiality on. But if we're talking about something a lot more serious, what changes isn't the law, what changes is our personal biases and what we think as a worker we should be doing. Um, yeah, so in sort of a nutshell, what the law, what your organisation or what your personal um, framework say, and then uh, the most important thing is the impact that that might have on the person or the client that you're working with. Sorry, we're just trying to fix the slideshow. Um, yeah, okay. So if in terms of what you take away today in terms of how you work or why you work what we just want you to take away is um, having a clear understanding of where you're making your decision from a consciousness about that and so the next slide is really just to highlight a little bit more about that in terms of there's no clear-cut answers around your decision making or way that you work because there are um, considerations such as the legal limits and possibilities relevant to any given situation and that will be different. Um, what are the legal rights and responsibilities of each person and is there any conflict and often there would be. <laughs> it depends on who your client is and what are what we've talked about a little bit about what quasi um, considerations are, what policies should work under which um, provide um, organisation processes and personal value judgments. And at the end of the day, it might be just that pragmatism about what realistically you can do there and then, whether that's at night, whether that's at, um, during the day. I always often say in terms of that pragmatism is even in terms of where you work can be quite different, which means your decision might be different. Um, for, you know, for, for, I guess, support workers at YAC, we have um, access to a, lot, a number of lawyers in terms of being able to check what our practice is and making sure that we're really clear where we're making our decisions from, whereas an outreach worker at 2am will not have that. And so one of the really takeaways that we also want to highlight is about um, hopefully your organisations have... Um, have a process where you can um, come back and discuss that because um, hindsight's always 2020, <laughs> and more more heads around the table about discussing something and, and having um, uh, a better response is always going to be better than one person. So um, we're just going to we're just going to put up like basically our overarching right space framework. We're only really talking a little bit about our framework. Um, and then um, a bit about probably what that looks like in terms of confidentiality. Um, and you'll see there's a whole lot of other stuff there that we do in our training, which we won't have time to do today. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do in terms of in practice, because we're about, you know, how that might work in practice is we're just really going to put up really quickly a scenario and then get you to have a think about that for a couple of minutes or while we're reading the scenario out to what, um, as a worker, your rights and obligations might be. And then also what the young person who's James in this scenario, what their rights are. Um, so James, he's 17 and he has an offending history, but none in the last year. He has a little bit prior to that. Um, and he was in a fair amount of trouble because his mum, she kept complaining about the volume he played his music at. When he left home, he took the Bluetooth speaker with him because, uh, because he ran short of cash. He's a bit worried about it and has come to see George, a youth worker at the local agency, for some advice. He's seen George um, a few times before because he's had obviously problems at home. George asked James what happened and James discusses the incident with him. George believes that a criminal offence has been committed. He advises James that it's probably best to get matters cleared up before he turns 18 so that he won't get a criminal 
record. George offers to go to, with James to see the police to get it all sorted. And looking at the circumstances, George tells James that he's most likely going to get a caution. So it's a formal warning. When they get to the police station, they find that James's mum has already reported the um, Bluetooth speaker is stolen and the police officer decides to question both the young person and the youth worker, having been told that James has basically confessed to George. So hopefully we can't see you, but there are some like red flags that have gone up in that scenario about um, the responses um, that the worker George has provided. Um, and if we can just get you to have a little think for a second about what um, George's rights or um, obligations might be in this scenario and also George, James as the, as, the, um, as the young person. Um, I think this scenario kind of highlights how sometimes as a worker we're trying to do the right thing um, and we're making a decision from where we think a law says we should be doing something when in fact in this situation that's not actually what's happened and it's got George the worker in trouble and actually obviously had major impacts for the, the young person. Um, so if we go just really quickly now because we, <laughs> yeah. So we're just going to put up some of the things that we've highlighted in terms of what are James's rights in this situation. So that's the young person. So one of those is that he doesn't have to go to the police station, that if he does go, he can leave at any time unless he's arrested. He has a right to silence, except he should provide his correct name and address. Um, he has a right to have a support person with him when he's interviewed. He has a right to access legal advice and he has a right to expect confidentiality from George. Okay, so if we then go to George, the worker, in terms of his rights and obligations to James, he can't force James to go to the police. He has no legal obligation to inform the police um, of the alleged flat theft, if it is all that. As workers, we're not lawyers. So in terms of what that really might look like to, um, I don't like to use the word non-lawyer, but non-lawyer. Um, it, it might be different to um, if James access some legal advice about that his own situation. He shouldn't lie or mislead police. Um, so he shouldn't say that he doesn't know anything. If he actually does, he should probably say that he just doesn't want to answer questions. Sometimes as workers, it is all about our language um, and, 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 and how we say things. Um, so if he is questioned by police, he has the right to silence himself, except to his correct name, age and address, that's the worker. And he also needs to understand the difference between legal advice and legal information. Oh, we often say, what is the difference between those things? And because of time and we can't see everybody on the screen. Um, so legal advice is really looking at the specific. So the specific, um, what specifically you should do. So using language like you should do, um, rather um, than when we're talking about legal information, which are general legal principles. So, you know, you have the right to silence, accept your correct name, age and address and not applying it to a specific situation, which is then legal advice. I hope that makes sense to everybody. <laughs> Uh, and he may have an obligation of confidentiality to James, which we're gonna talk a bit about. So in thinking about whether or not there is that obligation of confidentiality, <clears throat> yeah, we need to we need as workers to ensure that we have a, a clear understanding of our role. Um, so in terms of a support role, we are looking at things in terms of the context of stuff. So what's happening at the time at home, for example, or what's um, how things might be different now or um, what's going on at home. Lots of different things, depending on what your role is. We're not, we're not um, in terms of what we've put legal role, in terms of the when, where, how, what, and, and what happened. Like those are specifics to a situation, which in terms of if sometimes we know that stuff, what are then we going, what are we going to do with that information? Katrina uses the um the, the bus. Oh yeah, the dog and the bus. Yeah, so you know, the dog chasing the bus, what does it do when it catches it? So I suppose this is this is the um the stuff that's sitting under um why we're we're talking about these concepts, because confidentiality is tethered to information. So for a worker, 
if you don't understand what your job is in terms of your interactions with a client, then you may well be eliciting or obtaining information that for whatever reason you feel compelled to share. So, so before we even get to, you know, the rules around confidentiality, we have to understand that um, there are gates that workers can, can, or levers that workers can pull and should pull so that they don't put themselves necessarily in a situation where they are thinking, I have to tell someone else about this. Because it's that you can't know, um, know something. <laughs> <laughs> once it's been said, once it's been told, once you have it in your um, basket of knowledge, then you automatically have to start thinking about what do I do with this? And there are consequences either way. So there are consequences because we are sharing information that is probably in many situations going to be confidential in nature. What are the legal implications of that? Are there any ways we can share that that, that don't breach confidentiality? Um, and, and when does that confidentiality trigger? Okay, at what point is that obligation owed? So we're sort of coming at things a little bit sideways, but it hopefully will all be clear and, and make sense. But we, we think it's just really important to lay that groundwork because we do know that workers often get into a situation where they, where they, they are almost forced into a box and they're forced to make a decision about something um, which ideally they probably would have preferred <laughs> um, not to be in that space in the first place. And we say that one of the ways you can avoid that is to really be clear about what it is that you're there to do for that young person and therefore what information you need you need <laughs> from that young person to, to assist you to do your job. Yeah. So hopefully that, that sort of contextualises things a little bit. Um, and, and ultimately, this is the question that everyone would ask, you know, or ask themselves, am I competent in doing this? And what would a competent worker do in that situation? If they walked into this scenario with James, what would their response be? So would they maintain confidentiality? Would they listen to the story about the alleged theft and keep it to themselves? Um, or would they feel compelled to report that to police? So um, <laughs> in talking about confidentiality, we have to look at the competency of the young person, okay? They're really, um, as the law puts it, inextricably interwoven. <laughs> so, um, so the notion that um, a young person should have control over their personal private information um, is tethered to, I guess, their comprehension around and their <clears throat> capacity and their competency to um, control, to make decisions for themselves around controlling that information and how it moves and to whom it moves and under what circumstances it moves or is shared. So a question for a worker is, do I have a duty of confidentiality? Is the young person competent to make the decisions? Um, and if I have a duty of confidentiality, are there exceptions around that? And I think um, Monica may have touched on a couple of the exceptions um, in terms of she's highlighted a lot of legislation which talks about information sharing. Um, I might want to just quickly qualify something. Um, Monica was talking about there's no um, right to privacy uh, apart from what's enshrined in legislation. So we're not talking about this from a right to privacy point of view. We're talking, we sort of flip the coin and we're talking about duties of confidentiality. And there is case law around that, in particular, around situations where information that should have been regarded as confidential is shared um, and there's a detrimental impact to the person in the sense of there's a consequence to them that their information was shared. So we'll just sort of park that concept for a second and we'll unpack that a little bit more. So another thing to think of, are there other strategies that are available, that are available to a worker? Um, that might mean that they don't have to make a decision around whether to share or not. There's something else that they can do. Um, and of course, we would say as a worker, you always, always, always have to have in the forefront of your thinking and your decision-making processes, how will your action or your inaction, because an action has a consequence and inaction, doing nothing has a consequence, it's a decision. How will that impact that young person that you're dealing with, that you're working with? Anything you want to add? No, nope. that? No, awesome. cool. All right. <laughs> so 
competency and capacity. Now, this is a concept I know, not unfamiliar to most of you. Um, I'm going back and, and sort of um, teaching you basic principles again, I guess. But I think it's always worthwhile refreshing our mind about and revisiting this stuff because it really should sit at the base of, of how we work with young people. So does the client understand the physical, emotional and spiritual? So they're the dimensions, consequences of their decision. So we have to look at the young person holistically, look at the decision that they're going to make or we're making, perhaps on their behalf, um, and look at what impact in all the domains of that young person's existence will that have on them. And not only um, what will that impact be now, but going forward, how will that play out? How will that impact them in their future? And the case um, is one of Gillick, which is an English case which was adopted in Australia by another decision of the High Court here called Marion's case. And it actually concerned um, a young woman, uh, the mother of a, of a number of young women who um, wrote to a, a local health authority in the UK and said she didn't want her children, her young women, <coughs> her daughters accessing any information about reproductive rights or um, sexual health um, unless she was present. And the director of the health authority took that on board and wrote back to her mum, wrote back to this woman and said, well, thank you very much for that. But our practitioners will decide the nature of the discussions and the treatment which we provide to, to young women who may be well, um, well and truly under 18. And this proceeded all the way through the court processes until it got to the highest court in the land. And essentially what the court said was that, yes, we know that parents do have rights, but they also have obligations. And part of their obligation is to ensure that young people are equipped with capacities to make their own decisions as they grow and, and mature. Um, and the court said, we can't put in place a line in the sand around this because every young person is different. The process of growing up um, is different for every young person and, and a decision that one 15-year-old may be well and truly able to make, it may not be a decision that another 15-year-old is equipped to make, depending on that particular 15-year-old's um, life experience and capacity. Um, so the courts talk about um, intelligence, capability to make up your own, their own mind on the matter and sufficient understanding. And the understanding is linked to understanding of consequences for that young person. So the shorthand is that a young person is capable of giving informed consent and just keep that concept informed. in mind, informed consent, uh, when he or she receives, uh, achieves a sufficient understanding and intelligence to, be, uh, to enable him or her to fully understand what is proposed. And looking at what is proposed, maybe it's about sharing information, yep. So keeping that fully informed consent How in do mind. we do that as workers? <laughs> How do we tell whether a child is sufficiently mature to make a decision? So the more that more complex and serious the decision that is to be made and the younger the young person, the more a worker will need to do to ensure that the, um, they have an understanding. So it's really important to um, think about it's not about the decision, it's actually about an understanding that that will have and the impact that will have um, for that child or young person. It's about the understanding, not the decision. So understanding includes appreciating the possible con consequences and impacts of the decision, both long and short term. So that's probably easier said than done. But as workers, we are the ones that are probably best placed to do that. And we're probably trained to do that probably better than a lot of other professions. And some of the strategies we could use, we're just going to put up, is using language the young person understands. Going, yep, explaining the benefits and risks of the nature of the proposed topic and issues. We're very good at doing that in terms of a way that um, we ensure that young people can you know, reflect that back to us in their own words. We ask young people questions to determine whether they do actually understand what we're talking about and um, have an appreciation of the benefits and risks of their decision. Um, understanding of information provided and any alternative options if available and what's involved. So we explore that with young people and providing an opportunity for the young person to explain their understanding of the risk and benefits in their own way and their reasoning. 
So they're just some of the things that we would um, say or strategies we would use in terms of, um, you know, when we're talking to a young person about the short and long term consequences of the decision that they want to make. All right, oh, oh, you can, I'll read the question and you can say so once you've determined that a young person can make their decisions, um, so they're competent to make their decisions, do you need to keep those conversations and decisions about the topic confidential? Okay. So we're just building now on a different legal concept, which is confidentiality. But hopefully you'll see what the link was <laughs> there. Okay, so this is um, the law. And this is the judge made law. So this is based on cases that have been decided through the years around what the right to confidentiality looks like. Um, and essentially the question is this, did one person give information they didn't want generally known to another person in a situation where they would expect that second person not to share the information, not to disclose it? For example, um, basic example, talking to you about your personal health issues with a doctor. You'd expect that not to be shared. Um, this comes from a case, again, it's an English case, but it's good law in Australia, um, which involved actually a man who developed a design for a moped engine. And he spoke to some engineers about that engine design. Um, and in due course, um, without involvement of that Mr. Coco, Clark engineers actually went about building this engine and produced it. Um, and Mr. Coco, thought that he recognised sufficient elephant elements of his design that he felt um, he deserved some financial um, payback in relation, compensation in relation to, to his, his work and efforts. Um, ultimately, the court um, didn't provide him with any financial compensation because there were insufficient similarities between his original design and the final design that Clark engineers produced. But um, sometimes case law is made um, for, for people for the benefit of future cases, even though the person who actually takes the first step doesn't necessarily get what they're looking for. So um, the test where person gives information to another person, so A gives information to B, um, and A wouldn't expect it to be repeated. So it's a circumstance. So it's a private conversation, for example. So it's not held on a street corner with everyone to lis listening into. It's not at a team meeting, something that's disclosed at a team meeting, but it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, and the nature of the information is confidential. So it's not repetition of gossip. It's actually something personal to that individual. Now, there is a third element to this test, which we don't unpack completely, but essentially where the information is used. So use, use is a very broad term. Disclosure is use. Um, and there is some detriment that flows to the person, then they have a right basically to take action in relation to that. Now, now we would argue that if you've got um, a client who's imparting sensitive information about their life circumstances, um, then anytime that information is shared, there is absolutely at the very least a risk um, that that young person will suffer some sort of harm or detriment as a result of the mere fact of the information being exposed. So something to bear in mind in terms of, um, you know yourselves, the circumstances and the manner in which young people choose to share their stories. And, and that choice um, will come from a place of, in many cases, a self-protection and self-preservation because they're concerned about all of the impacts that will flow to them personally if this information is shared outside of a certain um, circumstance or situation. Yep. So we say there is a legal obligation not to share that information with somebody else if it's, as we say, imparted in a way that speaks to confidentiality or, or um, projects confidentiality. And if it's the type of information that really people would go, well, yeah, you wouldn't think someone would want to know, would want anyone else to know um, this about them, okay? So is there any legal concept? There are, of course, exceptions. There are also exceptions. Um, so often we then ask people about what those exceptions might be. The one that I guess often um, we use as an exception and the one we probably should be using is consent, permission. 
permission from the young person about sharing certain information. Yeah. So we don't actually necessarily recognise that there is that is a legal um, space we're coming from because the law actually says there are um, four situations in which you can share what would otherwise be confidential information, which might otherwise leave you open to be, you know, to, for legal action to be taken against you. Um, as Leanne said, the first of those is consent, and that's the one we say, you know, should be um, at the forefront. Uh, a law, which is some of the things that Monica touched on earlier, so legislation. Um, subpoena, which was also referenced by um, um, uh, previous speakers. Um, and risk of harm, which is one I think that the sector um, also Ghost keeps at the forefront <laughs> of their thinking when making decisions around confidentiality of information. So we're going to unpack each of those a little bit. So, so consent has some aspects to it, some legal tricks in there. So what does the law say amounts to valid consent? Um, well, the first thing is that you can't, you shouldn't be pressuring or tricking a young person um, into giving them, into allowing you to share their information. Okay, so it's got to be voluntary. It's got to come from a place of knowledge. Okay, um, so the young person should be aware of the choices and consequences. So what are they, what is their right to do? Can they say yes or no? If they say yes, what are the consequences? If they say no, what are the consequences? So they just need to have all of that unpacked for them in terms of supporting them to come to a place of capacity around making that decision and understanding where that what what that agency or worker is going to do with that information and it's got to be specific so a lot of um a lot of organizations for example might have the blanket consent form at induction at induction yeah, yeah. <laughs> um uh, once signed and sealed that's it so so we say for, for other reasons which we'll also go into that's not sufficient because consent has to be specific to the particular type of information that's going to be released. So giving a global consent to an organisation to share anything they feel is appropriate is not legally sustainable. Um, every time someone agrees to something confidential being shared about them, they should have the right to actually um, unpack what that looks like every single time for every piece of information. And of course, it's up to, up, up to the worker to establish the young person's legally competent to be able to give consent. And as we referenced before, um, workers have a lot of skill around um, supporting young people into a place where they have that competency. So um, talking them through risks and benefits and getting young people to express that um, in their own language about what that will mean to them now and going forward, okay? So a law, we've talked about some of those before. Yep, uh, so a legislative exception which stipulates you can or you have to share information. And there are both, there are both species in, in a legislation that impacts the work we do in the sector. So there are some laws which say you have to disclose certain things and there are some which provide a conduit for the sharing of information. That's particularly so in relation to the child protection space. We'll talk about some of that later on. Um, but we say for, look, for, for workers always ensure that if you are relying on a law that is a law, it's not about what your organizational policy says, um, but that there's a law. And oftentimes there is a law sitting under some sort of pol some policy directions. But I think it's really important for workers to, to unpack that a little bit for themselves so they understand not just what they have to do, but where that comes from, the why stuff. Yep. Uh, I mentioned before the Child Protection Act. So there's a, a significant number of provisions in the Child Protection Act which recognise that the information that gets um, shared around families and children in this space is highly sensitive and is therefore deserving of protection. It's deserving of confidentiality. Those people are deserving of, of um, having those stories um, quarterized and protected. Yep. Um, so that's the baseline. 
So the legislation says, but in order for us to do our job, in order for the child protection sector, sector to function, we have to have some flow. We have to have some conduit um, where sharing is possible and where people aren't going to be fearful of breaking the law or breaking out an obligation of, for example, their professional standards if they do the sharing. So there's provisions which speak to that and provide those protections. Um, one of those provisions um, is also about child safety being able to ask entities for information. Um, so it gives child safety, I guess, a lever to pull to go to an organisation and say, um, is this family working with you? Is this child working with you? And what are you doing in that space? Um, now, obviously, um, there are again, responses from the organisation that they can pull, that they can rely on around that. So the legislation actually specifically says, for example, um, if um, sharing that information could be expected to endanger a person's life or physical safety, and it's not actually in the public interest for it to be shared, then that's a reason for the organisation to say, well, we're not going to tell you that stuff. Or maybe the organisation says, we'll tell you some bits of the story, but we won't tell you everything. Okay. So, um, and also, I just want to add in too that the child protection legislation itself. So, at the very start of the legislation, there is some in, there is some words there around um, what the legislation is meant to do, how it's meant to work, and what principles the people who work in that um, under that legislation should be working under. So that includes your CSOs, your your, your practice managers, your your, your service um, team managers, and people who are from in a way drawn into that space um, and basically what the legislation says that um, inform information about a child affected by a decision and there's lots of decisions under the back that we're talking about should only be shared to the extent necessary for the purposes of the act so there should be should be very clear in the mind of the sharer which purpose which legislative purpose they're going to to support them asking for this information or for this information to be shared or them to share it. And it should be, it should always, always be shared in a way that protects the person's privacy. So that um, there are clear processes as to how that information is shared, um, you know, um, the manner in which it crosses um, barriers um, and the form of that information, as well as the content of it. Um, and of course, the legislation, I think I might have mentioned this, provides protections for people who do share in circumstances where otherwise they might be liable for breaching confidentiality. Um, what we've got here is just an example of perhaps a request that an organisation might receive um, for otherwise confidential information about a family or child they're working with. And they reference the particular section that allows them to make this request. And you might, they might ask about accommodation, they might ask about mental health issues, they might ask about risk of harm, they might ask about family support um, that's available to the young person, um, they might ask about broader, you know, broader supports, financial accommodation, etc. Um, and they might ask, do your agency know if there are any other agencies who are working with this young person? Um, so we just put up that because it's a sort of request that that might not come in a particular form, but that's the mechanism that the department perhaps is relying on to elicit that information. Um, and again, um, when deciding whether or not to share that information, it's useful for an organisation to know where that comes from and therefore what the consequences are for the to the organisation for either deciding to share or indeed deciding not to share. Okay. Now, um, manager report is, is a term that's used a lot in the sector but we just want to clarify our wording around that or what we say a manager reporter is. So we say a manager reporter um, is someone who has a legislative obligation. So a very clear legislative obligation. They're a person or a class of people, one of a class of people um, who have to, for example, report harm or suspected harm to a child, okay? Now, sometimes these obligations carry a penalty if the person fails to to um, fulfill that obligation to report. So clear examples, doctors, police, child advocate workers, residential care workers um, are obliged to report 
um, their concerns around risk of harm to children who are in the child protection system or who aren't in the child protection system. Um, State school and non-state school staff have some obligations in relation to sexual abuse that they suspect is happening, whether it comes from in or outside the home. So it's sort of a step removed from the child protection space because they're not talking about where it's only familial abuse, they're talking about external abuse. Um, and people who work in the family court space, because we have a lot of you know, um, mediators and counsellors who work in that jurisdiction, supporting families through the process, will from time to time be privy to um, information and discussions, which may raise concerns for them about the welfare of a child. Um, and again, this is a, uh, a clear cut conduit for them to be able to share that information without fear of, I guess, um, um, consequence to them individually. Um, worthwhile saying, of course, um, again, we started with, there are lots of bases upon which lawful sharing can happen. Um, and we're gonna keep talking about consent because that should be the space that everyone goes to first. Um, and just because you're a mandatory reporter doesn't mean that you can't go to consent if you think that's a possibility. Okay? And it doesn't mean you can't work with a, a young person even to get their consent to sharing information, particularly if you've got that capacity to unpack the why and the how and the where. Why do, why do we think this is a good idea to share? Um, how is that going to happen? I'm not going to stand on the rooftop and just, you know, blurt, blurt it out through a megaphone. It's going to be, you know... Um, a message or it's going to be um, put in a format that's available only to a particular person um, and and exactly what is going to be shared so what parts of their story is going to be are going to be retold so um, as i said um, these provisions in particular protect workers from liability for breach of confidentiality if they report provided that they follow the mechanisms set out in those pieces of legislation so now this brings us to something that's a little bit um, tricky in this space in the sense that it's quite a new um, obligation um, that's arisen from the um, Royal Commission into institutional responses to um, child sexual abuse. Um, that commission I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, there's been reports and governments across Australia have responded um, by putting in place various pieces of legislation to better protect um, children and young people who are in the care of institutions and who have suffered at the hands of, of those ostensible carers. So here in Queensland, we've had a rather unique approach to the recommendations. Um, um, I will say our obligation um, goes much further than the recommendations in the report. That's the path that our Attorney General chose. Um, so that as of 5th of April, there's now a positive obligation on um, all adults. So whether you're a worker or, or uh, in any other environment, um, you're an adult and you come across information suggestive, rather that causes you to believe that a child has been the victim of a sexual offence, um, then you're obliged to put, report that to police. Um, want to make clear that it's only about um, offences committed by adults, which of course is anyone 18 or over. Um, and of course that the law does permit um, circumstances where that obligation is relieved, okay? So for example, if the young person is now 18 and decides they don't want the matter reported, then that is their choice. Um, and the, um, the report doesn't need to be made. Um, if the person who receives the information believes that someone's already done it or will report it, for example, they know that the young person is working in a space where there's a mandatory reporter involved, then they might reasonably believe that they don't have to make the report themselves because someone else will. Um, and the other one, which is quite a significant one, um, and at the moment, unfortunately, is pretty much untested, the other one concerns where reporting would endanger someone's safety. Um, they are literally the words of the provision, endanger someone's safety. We can't really unpack that any further, except I would perhaps say um, um, endangerment of safety might take a lot of different guises depending on the individual. So some of us might go to physical safety, some of us might go to you know, mental health safety, other elements. Um, okay, 
Uh, this is just a fact sheet, which again, we'll send out with, um, with our PowerPoint as well, which basically unpacks a little bit more fulsomely that, that provision. Um, it's a very tricky space, mainly because it is untested. Um, so in practice, what do mandatory reporting rules mean? Um, well, it means that the obligation really sits on, on those mandatory reporters or anyone who believes they're in that space of having to report for example, on the fence to police, um, is ensure that the young people they're working with are provided with information on the procedure, the process, what that's going to look like. Um, and one would hope that organisations who are in this space would have policies to which, which a worker can, can go to to support them in their decision-making process and to support them in unpacking things for, for their clients. Um, so, again, it's up to each of us as workers to inform ourselves around what those policies look like. And I know that is um, a task often, and often it's, it's only that we go to the policy when there's the crisis moment. Um, but um, ideally policies should be built from the ground up in an organisation so that everyone should have a say about what things look like because sometimes um, there's a tendency for perhaps the management to think that they've experienced every possible situation and therefore they can fulsomely write a document. Whereas in truth, it's the workers who are facing the day to day who might be better placed to inform what those policies actually look like. Um, and of course, um, young people accessing a service have the right to know at the start and at any other time where a decision's being made around them or their information, they've got a right to know what those policies look like. So, you know, so what will happen if I disclose X to a worker? You know, what, what's, what's going to, what, what is that going to mean for me? So we think these are elements, um, not only good practice, but they actually support a better legal response to situations like decisions, tricky decisions around when or when or when not to maintain confidentiality. Um, uh, subpoenas are another basis, of course, on which information might leave your hands and go to someone else in a circumstance which otherwise would breach confidentiality. So we're talking about a requirement to attend court, answer questions or provide documents. And obviously, if you don't attend court, then there are consequences. If you don't answer questions, there are consequences. Um, I think that pretty much speaks for itself. Um, risk of harm, I think, is one that we could probably unpack a wee bit mm -hmm. because it's so often talked about in the sector. So these are the hallmarks of of a risk of harm which gets you over the obligation which would otherwise exist to maintain confidentiality. So it should be an immediate risk, an identifiable risk, and a serious risk. So not just, I think that maybe perhaps something bad will happen, but I am reasonably convinced that unless something intervenes, then very soon, if not, you know, immediately um, something very serious will happen to this person or someone else. That's this person will do something to harm themselves or I'll do something to harm somebody else. So it's a high bar. It's not a low one. Exactly right. That's exactly right. It is a high bar. And I think we, um, we need to keep reminding ourselves of that because um, the obligation of confidentiality shouldn't be displaced lightly. I mean, you've seen what the exceptions are. Um, they're, they're very clear. Um, I would argue they've all got a reasonably um, high standard around them. And so risk of harm sits there as well. Um, because as I said, we're looking at what is the public interest in saying to people, no, you really don't have a right to confidentiality or you do have a right to confidentiality right up until the point where you are posing a serious credible um, writ, um, risk of harm to somebody. Okay, that's when the public says, look, yeah, we've all got individual rights and freedoms and we've got the right to information, but that sort of stops when we're, you know, posing a serious risk of harm to somebody else. So the threshold is high. So we're just going to go back to the scenario, if you can remember that, just in terms of, just a conclusion to summing up that, in terms of putting that into practice a little bit. So if um, James is competent, so we've talked a little bit about competency, um, and and George owes, then George owes James a duty of confidentiality, then George is bound by law not to breach that confidentiality. The fact that he is a child is irrelevant. Um, George is under no legal obligation to report to anyone when, what James has told him and um, should be 
George should be aware that he could be called as a witness because obviously James has told him information in relation to um, um, what perceived went on with the Bluetooth speaker. <laughs> Um, George has an obligation to provide information about choices and consequences. So remember, it's about the language we use. It's not about what, um, it's not about directing someone to do a certain thing. Because George in this situation has attempted to give legal advice and James has made a decision based on incorrect information, which could mean that George and the organisation may be at risk of having an action of negligence brought against um, against them. And that might be because, for instance, James might have had to go to court, got a conviction, and then couldn't, um, couldn't um, join the military, for example, um, because he has now um, um, a conviction recorded against him. So just like thinking about what those consequences might be in terms of your actions when you're working with young people. So we just thought we'd sum up with a couple of questions that might be useful in terms of um, asking yourself before sharing information. And one of those is, is the client competent? Do I then owe a duty of confidentiality to that client? Is keeping confidentiality part of a standard of care? So best practice of what a worker would do in terms of competent youth worker. Um, so it's not all youth workers, it's just a standard. Um, and would I be negligent if I breach this standard by breaching confidentiality? Um, and is there any exception which allows me to breach confidentiality, which means my action and work is not negligent? Yeah. And a key message to take away is a young person should be provided with information around reporting procedures and obligations to ensure they can make an informed decision about what they decide to tell a worker or agency and they, because they then know where that information will go. Yeah. <laughs> I think at the end. And, and just a final quote, because we love a quote here. They're not adults in making, um, but they do have current rights and needs and experiences and they should be taken seriously. And therefore, when a young person tells us a story, we should um, treat that um, with, with due care. I guess, in terms of, of how we how we use that information and where we send that information. So that's us. We might stop sharing and go back to our moderators. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. We did have one question come through the chat while you were talking. Um, and I, it was around the um, sharing of where you believe a child has been sexually assaulted or um, sexual assaulted. Um, so the question was, in this instance, does children mean a person under 16 or a person under 18 with an impairment of mind? Correct. So a child under 16 or if they're under 18, if they have an impairment of the mind, that's it. So... Right. Um, a 16-year-old girl who might come in discussing her relationship with her boyfriend um, or her pregnancy, there's no obligation raised. Um, and we didn't mention this in the talk, but I suppose the other important piece of information for, for young people um, is that just because a matter has been either information has been passed to either child safety, for example, or to the police, for example, um, that doesn't necessarily mean an outcome that you anticipate or that that young person anticipates will flow and that as we know in the child protection system young people's rights are threaded throughout that in terms of engagements around decision making and in terms of how the police operate again young people have rights around that people can't be compelled for example to engage with the police investigation and just as a worker, because we've then um, reported something, doesn't mean we yeah. have um, been a competent worker uh, or support person for that person, because there might be other standards that we might um, or should be should be doing um, or responses we should be doing with that young person or yeah, client. Yeah. It's not just reporting, tick box, see you later. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And um, we're, Karen has got her hand up. Karen, did you have a question you'd like to ask? Karen. 
Karen's on mute. Yes, I think we're trying to unmute. Ah, <laughs> you've got the control. <laughs> Can Karen unmute herself? No. Oh, she's taken her hand down now, so maybe she's just a little bit shy. <laughs> maybe type it in the chat. No, Karen. Yeah, if you'd like to put it in the chat, Karen, if you do have a question. But really wanted to say thank you to you lovely ladies from Yak. You um, did a very, very comprehensive um, discussion there, and it was absolutely brilliant. A lot of information. I mean, I've been in this field for over 20 years, and there was still stuff that I definitely have never heard before. So it's really good to, um, you know, I guess get a refresh as well on all this um, legal stuff because things are always changing. And I think it sort of goes back to what Monica was saying as well about, um, you know, human rights and embedding, um, you know, children, young people, families, privacy back into your policies, procedures, um, and linking it back to the legislation that has come in. Um, it's really important. Um, are there any other questions from anyone? No. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you're all joining us still. Um, so now we've got uh, Tom Orsop. So Tom is PCARE's Principal Advisor, Strategy and Policy. Um, he's responsible for advocacy and leadership and the provision of specialist expert advice on legislative policy program practice trends and issues concerning child protection and the family support sectors. Tom's expertise includes the influence of technology and digitally enabling capabilities on the community sec service sector and the contemporary intersection of people and technology. Tom brings to today's conversation with more than 10 years experience as a senior manager and director with Queensland government where he was responsible for the information and communication technology operations and the technical security of multiple government agencies and the implementation of many, many nationally significant and critical ICT programs and projects. Um, so yeah, just wanna say thank you, Tom, for joining us and we will let you share your screen. Wonderful, thank you, Beck, and thank you all of the presenters um, from this morning's session. Um, I hope everyone had an enjoyable short break. I'll bring up some slides. Um, bear with me just a moment. And I have about 20 minutes today with you to talk about cybersecurity and information security. And, and I guess kind of bring together what we've discussed this morning around all of those good practice things that you need to do around seeing consent, kind of making sure that you've got good practices and processes for respecting the privacy um, and the rights that your service users have to privacy of their information. But very importantly, there's things that you need to do to ensure that even if you've done everything right, you've collected all of that, that you are still putting protections around the information that you hold on behalf of your service users, the information you hold on behalf of your organization, and building on that, the reputation of your organization, the money that your organization has. Um, so thinking about kind of what you need to do to bring all of these things into place, considering that it's very likely that your organization and the work that you do, most of the information you have will actually be sitting inside a computer or many computers or sitting in a cloud somewhere. I do wanna begin kind of by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land in which we are meeting today. I wanna to extend that acknowledgement to the lands that you're joining us from today, appreciating this as a virtual session. And being a virtual session, I think it lends itself well to talking about cybersecurity. I was also asked just to touch briefly on if we have time, uh, just on a general understanding of what it means to um, talk about the cloud and cloud computing. And I've also got a few slides just touching on things for organizations to consider if you are thinking about upgrading your ICT systems and infrastructure. So I'm gonna focus predominantly on security, but if we have time and time permits, um, I will touch on the cloud and infrastructure. I have prepared quite a detailed set of slides, which I'd be happy to share after the session if we don't get through all of the content. Just a brief acknowledgement uh, at the outset, particularly when it comes to cybersecurity, the Australian Cybersecurity Centre is the paramount place for all things cybersecurity. They have an incredible range of resources for organisations, large, medium and small. Uh, and in the last 12 months, they've responded to more than 67,000 cybersecurity um, reports of incidents for individuals and organizations. Um, so every year we see a very significant increase. So 
a 13% increase just in the last 12 months. We expect that to continue. Um, and if you haven't been touched by a cybersecurity incident yourself or your organisation, for every 100 people in Australia, two and a half of them each year will be impacted by a cybersecurity incident. So why should you care about this? Well, personally and professionally, it will affect everyone at some point in their life. It could have a very minor impact on you or it could have an absolutely catastrophic and devastating impact on you or your organisation. So there are organisations who have lost hundreds of millions of dollars because of very small attacks, individuals who've had their identity stolen and have to rebuild from scratch. Um, it's complex. The internet cybersecurity is very complex. You don't need to be an expert to put in place protections and controls that will cover you and your kind of um, your daily use of the internet. So don't feel like it's something that's too complex for you to take active steps. And very importantly for this group, within your service agreements that you sign up to, particularly for government funded organizations, there are obligations on you to be adhering to information and cybersecurity requirements. So within Queensland government service agreements uh, under clause 18, there's an expectation that you will treat the confidential information that you hold at the commensurate level to how government treats its information. So there's specific standards around that. Uh, there's also an information privacy principle, which we talked about in the next session, around the secure storage of personal and confidential information. But really it comes down to, these are things that you can do to protect your reputation, your money, your information, and that of your service users. Now I'm gonna talk about the three most common types of cybersecurity threats. Some of the software considerations that kind of need to be made around how you can protect yourself, both for your organizations and personally for yourself, because it's also about protecting your personal use of information and some of the people and procedures. Now that's important to note that 99% of cybersecurity threats require a person to do something for them to be effective. So if you know what not to do, very likely you are going to be able to avoid kind of any adverse cybersecurity threat impacting yourself or your organization. Now, every day there's about 122 to 130 billion emails sent across the globe. And of that, 85% of those emails are spam. Now, if you work in a big organization, that means that you could be blocking every day without knowing it 70 to 100,000 emails from entering your inboxes that are spam related, some of them will get through. And about two and a half percent of that 85% are kind of malicious. So most of them are just kind of your friends in Nigeria looking for you to hold some money for them temporarily while they um, migrate. But two and a half percent of those are actually designed to do malicious damage to your computer, uh, to get inside your computer and look for things. And that's what we call malware. So. The things like spyware, they go in and monitor what you type. So look at what you're looking at, capture all of your keystrokes. There's worms that get into systems and then find their way into other systems. Uh, Trojans, which kind of look like normal things, but then appear. So a Word document that isn't quite a Word document. And really the major target for the majority of these at the moment is around accessing your sensitive financial information. So it's looking for your credit card details, looking for client information around their financial details, if that's something you collect. It's looking for bank account details of your organization, uh, but it's also looking to kind of, for information around potential clients. So what information could potentially have monetary value to someone? Do you have information in your records that holds the locations of domestic and family violence refuges? Uh, what sensitive information could be commoditized by a malicious actor? Now really, they're not targeting you. Uh, very rarely, if almost never, would someone maliciously target you. There's companies around the world. They're actually proper companies that send out spam. So seven of the 10 biggest spam companies in the world sit in America. The biggest company sits in the Ukraine. It's actually called Canadian Pharmacy. So these are companies that every day send out spam and malicious things inadvertently. A small company makes about $7,000 a day sending spam emails to you. So there's a lot of money to be made in this. Um, so these aren't just kind of kids sitting in their bedroom firing off emails. These are big companies who do it for a living. Now, it's very easy to protect yourself against that these days. The biggest thing you can do, and you'd be surprised at how many people don't do this, is turn automatic updates on. Now, if you're using Windows or Microsoft products, 
you can make sure that you automatically update your computer. It's not difficult to do. If you work in a larger organization, your organization's IT department should have this done by default. That will protect you in 99.9% .9 of cases. Those automatic updates more often than not are protecting you from vulnerabilities that have been identified. So you don't have to worry about that. Now, if you use Microsoft, which we pretty much all do, you can rest assured that about 43% of all of the spyware and Trojans target Microsoft accounts. So you are very much kind of at an increased risk if you use Microsoft of being targeted. Therefore, it's important that you're constantly updating your operating system. So Windows 10 or Windows 7 uh, and the software that you use. That'll cover 90% to 99% of everything you need. Also back up your data. It's so critically important, particularly for small organizations to back up your data regularly and ensure that it actually is being backed up because it is quite likely at some point in time that you will lose your data and need to go back to a backup. And it's very difficult to do that if it's not there. Another important thing is make sure you've got virus protection. Uh, things will get into your computer. You want virus protection to stop that from happening. And if you've got those things, you very rarely would ever have to worry about malicious software getting into your computer. Scam emails and texts. Now there's a significant increase in the um, kind of prevalence of this. And these are particularly targeted to vulnerable people. So whereas malware, you can't take personally if you receive one, you probably can if um, you start to receive um, kind of malicious scam emails and texts, particularly if they're the more sophisticated ones targeting you. And I've included an image on the right there because for most people, they would have seen a lot of their social network friends commenting on the kind of quizzes and polls that land around your favorite colors and the kind of things that you did when you were young. They're not there for entertainment purposes. More often than not, they're there to start collecting information on you that they can use to access your accounts. So if they've got your email address, your birth date from your Facebook profile and your first car, because you thought it would be fun to share with your friends, that's often the things that they need to call your bank and kind of change the password so they can access that. So think about that when you're looking at those, that very rarely are they designed for just your own enjoyment. They're normally designed for someone else's benefit. Now, they transcend normal email. They go across mostly social media now, which is becoming more and more prevalent. Most of the time, they're very unsophisticated, but particularly for big organizations, there's very sophisticated, what they call spear phishing attacks that target your company CFO, your CEO, anyone who has a financial authority. So anyone who can get an email that looks to come from someone but actually isn't seeking approval for a payment to be made, that becomes increasingly common these days. Now, with this one, it's a bit more tricky, particularly for those that are really well designed and targeted. And most organizations, you have to publicly announce who your CFO and CEO is. You just need to be really mindful of unexpected kind of invoices that come through that you don't quite know you're expecting, but normally they're a bit urgent or overdue and they need the money now. Any attachment you get, which just looks a bit suspicious, it's best not to open it at all. Just ask the person who received it, did they send you that attachment in the first place? Because most often, if you're not expecting it um, and it looks a bit suspicious, it is. Um, and never respond to anyone who ever sends you anything asking for your login details to be verified. Um, no one will ever do it. Um, and you should always call them back to confirm. So really simple things, but you'd be surprised at how often people don't follow that. Um, so for every 12 and a half million spam emails sent on a day, one person replies. Um, so that's too many. But when you think about 122 billion emails and 85% of them being spam, that's a lot of replies. Now, ransomware. Ransomware is becoming one of the more focal ones. There's been some very big organizations affected by ransomware. Um, the image on the right is actually the image of a very big and successful piece of ransomware called WannaCry. WannaCry came from a couple of years ago and caused $8 billion of damage over 150 companies, uh, sorry, countries, and infected 200,000 computers and locked their users out of all of their data. Um, this happens frequently. It's happened in Queensland. It's happened across Australia. It's shut down very big organizations for weeks. Um, and a lot of organizations lost data that they could never retrieve just because of these simple ransomware um, pieces. The advice of the Australian Security Cyber Security Centre is never pay a ransom. Um, you are very unlikely to ever get your data back or your money back, and you make yourself very vulnerable to everyone else who wants to send you uh, ransomware attacks because you've shown that you're willing to pay. 
and the controls are exactly the same as for malware, automatic updates, make sure that you've got regular backups because that's the only thing normally that can restore from a very significant ransomware attack is you've got to blast away everything and start again. So you want to have your data backed up and virus protection. So these we've seen 15% more in Australia, 15% more ransomware attacks than this time last year. And that will continue to escalate because they're very commercially profitable for the people who send them out. Now, looking at the things that you can do to protect yourself, we've already talked about automatic updates. I cannot stress enough how important they are and how simple they are to do. They, you set them, you forget about them. They will just make your life infinitely easier. They'll happen while you're asleep um, and they'll keep your computer up to date. Automatic backups as often as possible for all of your important data. It is so cheap now to store data that's so important to have it in a safe place because it is very likely that you will lose it at some point and need to restore it. Uh, big organizations would have multiple, if not kind of 10, 15, 20 requests a week for some data to be restored. It's not uncommon. So if you're a small organization, make sure that you very much focus on having backups of your data and testing that those backups work because it's all well and good to think you're backing up, but if you're not actually backing up what you need, when you need it, you'll find out very quickly. And also store your backup somewhere that's not where your normal data sits. So a lot of people make the mistake of backing up their data and putting it right next to all of their other data so that it all disappears at the same time. Uh, that's particularly for organizations who are using cloud software, try not to keep it in the same place. It's very important if it's a backup, it's gotta be a secure, kind of storage of information somewhere else. Um, that's the best thing that you can do. Now also, and this is becoming increasingly common, but so essential is multi-factor authentication. Everyone would be familiar with this if you um, use banking, if you've logged into something where you get a little code on your phone. Uh, it's really around saying there's a bit of information you know, normally a password or a PIN number, and either something you inherently possess, so your fingerprint, your iris scan, if you've got a... Um, a smartphone or something that kind of is separate like a phone. It's, it is very difficult for someone to steal your identity, for someone to log into your secure information if they not only need your password, but also need to be holding your phone. So very much multi-factor authentication, particularly for protecting sensitive information for your bank account, for if you've got remote workers who work on the go. Uh, it doesn't take long, but it is an incredibly good way of securing your information. Now, people and process. So you'd be amazed at how many organizations don't actually go and clean up their access controls. So you have a lot of staff who come in and out, a lot of casual staff, they get their access provided to them. They can access their information in the workplace. If you're one of the more modern enterprises who is working on the cloud, they can normally access it from home. Can they still access it after they've finished working for your organization? If you're not regularly going and checking who can access the information in your systems, you are creating incredible vulnerabilities for people to continue accessing that information after they've left your organization. So that's really important. You have regular regimes of checking who can continue to access your information. And also, if you've had someone who's worked in your organization for 10 or 15 years, do they still need to access that same information as they move through your organization doing different roles? The principle should always be, what's the least amount of information I need to do my role effectively? And if you need more, it's for that period of time that you need it. Um, and that's particularly relevant for people working with client information. You should only need the client access to the client information that supports the work that you need to do at that point in time. Training your employees, credibly, you need to train them and they need to be knowledgeable around this. So as I said, 99% of all of these malicious attacks require someone to do something. Um, therefore, if they know what not to do, then it's very likely that your organization will be protected from an incident occurring when the vast majority of incidents require some form of human intervention. And finally, passphrases. You might actually hear a bit about this on the radio. There's a campaign at the moment about passphrases becoming the new way of protecting your information. So I've actually brought across, and this is from the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, talking about actually commercially uh, what it costs to crack your password. So consider this particularly for your bank account. Um, at a more personal level and think about the password that you currently have. Anyone with a little bit of technical smarts who spends enough time on the internet looking for things um, that potentially we wouldn't like them to look at is able to access your password for a small fee. 
So if you've got a fairly simple password, it costs less than a cent to crack that uh, and it's pretty instant. If you've got a little bit more complexity to that, you've thrown a couple of special characters and an exclamation mark in there. It normally takes between kind of an hour and two days and costs between $6 and 500. Uh, and these are real costs. This is what people actually pay to um, access other people's passwords. Um, again, a little bit more complicated. It's around kind of building slowly that complexity. But when you look at kind of, even when you think that kind of one down here around kind of A, F, S, and um, D, 8, J, it's like two and a half hours and about the cost of a large pizza to break your um, complex password. However, if you move that into a sentence, you make that kind of a little bit longer than usual. You make it a sentence which isn't too obvious and you put an exclamation mark at the end. That same attack that costs um, $30 for your complex password now costs $107,000 to crack and takes more than a year to do it. The systems and computers aren't designed yet to crack these. Um, so it's easy to remember. It takes a little bit longer to type, but it gives you incredible protection over your information when really the most complex passwords you probably currently have costs a couple of hundred dollars to crack and a couple of hours to do it. So really mindful of if you are thinking about how you want to protect your information, passphrases are a very good way of doing that. So for bigger organizations, for those who have already got all those things in place, um, I won't go through all of these because we've touched on most of them already. There is a thing called the essential eight maturity levels for information security and cybersecurity. There are eight things that all organizations are recommended to do to ensure they are protecting themselves from cybersecurity threats. So we've talked about security, we've talked about patching, multi-factor authentication. There's some specific things around disabling features. So anyone who's still using old browsers, please stop doing that now. It's very insecure. Uh, and for organizations who are doing it, they should upgrade very quickly because it creates significant risk. Um, but the Australian Cybersecurity Centre will provide an incredible amount of resources based on your organisation size to help you work through this. Okay, I'm going to touch very briefly now and move to the cloud. So not everyone knows what the cloud is uh, and it's deceptively complicated in the way that people describe it, but inherently very simple. Uh, the cloud is just a data centre. Uh, it's just a place where you store data. It's just not a place that you own that you store data. So it's owned by a third party. It's owned by Microsoft or Apple or if you're in Queensland, there's a company called NextDC. Um, and it's just their huge factories of servers that store your data. Um, that picture on the right is the Microsoft data center. Uh, that's the one in Chicago. They just, what they look like, they look pretty cool. Um, they are very expensive. They kind of consume huge amounts of electricity to keep them cool. Uh, but that's where all of your data lives if you um, use Facebook or if you store things on OneDrive. Now, the thing that organizations are more familiar is the thing around cloud computing. So any service, anything you use on the internet uh, is a cloud computing service. So Facebook is cloud computing. Uh, Google Drive is cloud computing. If you use a survey monkey, that's cloud computing. So you're paying for the privilege or you're using a service that's located somewhere else. You don't locate it within your own data center because normally you don't have one. Uh, it's owned by someone else and you're just renting a little bit of that service for the time that you need it. Uh, if you use TikTok, that's in a data center in China. So that's one of the challenges of certain applications is you don't quite know where your data lives. Uh, and very briefly, looking visually at the difference. So if you're a big organization who says that you keep all of your IT on premise, it just means that you own it all and you can access it without going to the internet. That's all on premise means is you own that physically you can get to it without having to go to the internet to access it. If you're a small organization and you do everything through what's called the public cloud, which most do, it just means that you've got a firewall that you get to the internet through, which stops most of the things that kind of are trying to get back. And you're using public services like Google and Microsoft or um, Apple. Now, private clouds, this is where bigger organizations who invest, they actually own their own. So they'll go to a company and say, I'd like a bit of your cloud, please, but I want it just for me. Uh, that means they have dedicated storage, dedicated services somewhere else. They'll know where it is, but it's just for them. No one else shares that. So they have a bit of additional security around what that means. Now, in the very few minutes I have left, talk briefly about if you're an organization considering 
upgrading your ICT infrastructure and systems. A couple of years ago, we actually surveyed 105 Queensland community sector organisations, ran six workshops across the state to talk about why people feel like they might need to upgrade their IT and what were the drivers for that. So a lot of those around pressure to do more with less, which would be very familiar to many people, uh, changes in funding sources, increased demand and expectation from your service users to become more digital in your services. Uh, and keeping pace with new technology, which is a very difficult thing to do uh, to try and keep pace with everything that's coming out. Now, my biggest recommendation as someone who's worked in the sector of long time and have implemented large IT programs is the IT part of the IT program is by far the simplest bit. Uh, for anyone who's been involved or is thinking of doing an ICT project, the IT is the simple bit, it's the people and the change in the training that's very difficult. So you've got to have a really good focus on the planning for your change, uh, why you're doing your change. So not thinking about changing your IT because it feels good to have new IT. It's what value does this give to the people who are going to use it and the service users who you are providing that service to. Uh, mobility, thinking about how can my kind of staff and service users use this out and about and on the go. Um, and the change around COVID has definitely shown us the value of being kind of increasingly mobile making sure you've trained your staff well and they're ready kind of and supported to embrace a change, including acknowledging that it's difficult to move from system to system and there needs to be some flexibility and support around that transition. And again, focusing on the change. The IT and the system side is the easy bit. It's getting people to embrace a change system, change practices, which is where a IT project and implementation will either succeed or significantly fail is if people aren't willing to accept that change, then it doesn't matter how good your system is, they'll find ways not to use it. And that's it for me, any questions? Thanks, Tom, that was brilliant. Very comprehensive yet again. Um, you know, I, I think um, a lot of stuff came up. We were sort of having a bit of a, thing and Monica's actually got a couple of notes written on her hand with things that she needs to go home and do <laughs> when she gets there yes. as well. Yes, yes, I, um, I'm going to be updating my own personal virus protection software and backups and uh, thank you on behalf of all of us on the line for taking the fun out of Facebook. Uh, yeah, yeah, noted, noted, duly noted all of the um, uh, all of the stuff that we really need to be mindful of and I think in frontline service provision, it's so very easy to think about our clients and, and all of that stuff and lose sight of uh, the technological infrastructure that sits behind the work we do, we do and, and, and makes it possible. There was a question that was submitted via registrations, Tom, which I'm going to take the liberty of asking you now. Um, and it did go to the issue about those, those SurveyMonkey platforms like SurveyMonkey where the data is stored overseas. Uh, and organisations, you know, because those services are free, are very uh, tempted to use them readily. And, you know, that includes QCOS. Um, but, but do you, you know, I guess in your view, do you think that, um, you know, we, we're too ready to embrace those free technologies without fully considering where the information is going to be stored um, and also uh, skipping over the requirement for client consent in that process? Absolutely. I think it's, it's important to look at all of these new digital capabilities we have can be of value to an organisation if they're used well and they're used for the right purpose. So Pete Care, we use SurveyMonkey a lot uh, because it's a really great valuable tool uh, for collecting a lot of information quickly. Um, but we acknowledge up front that that data is going to be stored offshore um, and it's going to be stored in countries that may not have the same data protections that exist within Australia um, or the European Union, which has better data protections than Australia. Um, now, I won't steal the thunder of the next presenter who will be focusing on information privacy and the information privacy principles, but particularly in Queensland, something to be really mindful of is uh, the obligations we have under the Information Privacy Act for uh, seeking consent for people and disclosing when we are going to be storing their personal information overseas. So it's something we can do, uh, but it's always good at the outset of using a technology where you know the data is going to be stored outside of Australia is to let the person whose data you're storing know that and seek their consent 
uh, either through their kind of awareness and participation in the process um, or actively providing that consent to you that their data will be stored overseas. Um, so it's around thinking about they're good to use, but just be mindful of what you're using them for. So if you're collecting information on a whole bunch of young people and some very sensitive things, I wouldn't use SurveyMonkey for that. But if you're just getting a general perceptions of feelings about something um, in a more anonymized way, then they're great tools. So it's just finding the right tool, then using it the right way so that you can continue to control the information that you're looking to collect. Terrific. And that just reiterates the theme that we're hearing throughout this morning's session about being absolutely crystal clear, the, the purpose for which we collect information uh, and what we intend to do with it. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, everyone. All right, please feel free people to put comments in, in the chat and um, uh, we'll continue to monitor that. Uh, it's now um, our very great pleasure to introduce and welcome our final speaker for today's session. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, Professor John Swinson. Uh, John's joining us from the University of Queensland uh, today. Uh, he's a former colleague of mine as well, so it's really lovely, John, to see you again on the screen. Uh, uh, I'm just going to read out John's bio and then he's going to take us through uh, some content around the Privacy Act and Australian privacy principles. And it's going to be a lovely way to round out what we've heard uh, today. Uh, John um, uh, has had a very long career in uh, private practice and is a former partner of King & Wood Mallisons, which is uh, a major uh, international law firm. He's got 30 years of legal experience and uh, his primary focus has been on technology law and intellectual property law. Um, at UQ, John is teaching subjects, uh, a range of subjects, including internet law, privacy law, cybersecurity law, uh, information technology law, copyright law, uh, and uh, applying law to new technologies. Uh, and um, once he graduated from law school, this is the fun fact that uh, I've been uh, very keen to share with everybody. Uh, John went to go and do postgraduate studies at Harvard Law School, uh, where um, Barack Obama was a member of his graduating class. Um, so how's that for a claim to fame, John? That's pretty cool. Um, uh, John's got a lot of experience in domestic and international aspects of licensing, copyright, patent, trademark, trade secret, electric commerce and privacy laws. And since 2000 has been a domain name arbitrator for the World Intellectual Property Organization under the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy. Uh, and the uh, dispute resolution policy and has decided over 550 domain name disputes. John's a past president of the Australian, Australian Fulbright Alumni Association uh, and enjoys assisting technology and data businesses to grow and to avoid le uh, legal pitfalls. So thank you so much, John, and um, over to you. Good, thanks, Monica. Can you hear okay? Yeah, Good. that's great, yep. So Today, I'm, I'm going to give a summary of privacy law, but through the lens of the Privacy Act and the Australian Privacy Principles. Uh, and so it's a, in some ways, it's a very specific presentation, but we'll start broadly and, and, and uh, uh, narrow down as we go, go. So I'm going to talk about privacy law to start with, then to whom does the Privacy Act apply? What are the key obligations under the Privacy Act? The Australian privacy principles, and then we'll look at a few case studies if we have time. So that's uh, that's the agenda for the next half hour. And so the, the big questions, whenever you're looking at privacy, and whenever I'm giving a class at university, I always start with, well, why does privacy matter? And there's a big debate going on at the moment as to whether the law has gone too far in protecting privacy, so making it hard for businesses and organizations to actually operate. So is privacy actually hindering the delivery of the service? Or has the law not gone far enough? And so do we have organizations such as Facebook and Google taking advantage of our, taking advantage of us and, and invading our privacy? Which really leads to the question of what does privacy law protect and why do we actually have privacy law? And that's actually a really big question. 
Uh, it takes it probably a whole course for a semester to answer that question as to what does privacy law protect. Uh, privacy means different things to different people. And so what privacy might mean to your mother might be very different to what privacy means to you or to your daughter, for example. Privacy means different things to different people in different countries. So someone who's living uh, in the hills of China might have a different view of privacy to someone who's living in a penthouse apartment in New York. And at different times, if you were looking at privacy in London in the 1700s when there was no sewerage system, you might have a different view of what privacy is like to someone who's living uh, uh, today in London. And so it's, it's something that does mean different things to different people. In, in relation to that London example, there's a great book on etiquette that talks about uh, privacy in 1700. And it's a, it's a book on etiquette for people living in the 1700s. And it says, if you see someone going to the toilet in the park, uh, please respect their privacy and don't talk to them. And so it's a, so when you've got a, a place where there's no sewerage, there's a different view of, of privacy. In fact, people will say privacy is, is for rich people. You know, if you're a king living in a castle or a Hollywood star living behind the wall, you might have more privacy than someone who's just living in a in a in a in a housing tenement or in an in an African village. Uh, some people are hermits and some people are show-offs. So it's a, it's something which is it's quite relative. And so it makes it hard for the law to deal with privacy when different people have different uh, views of what, what is privacy. It's important to know that privacy is not absolute. It's not uh, an absolute right. In fact, there are very few absolute rights when, you, when you're looking at human rights and, and so on. There's probably an absolute right not to be tortured, but privacy is a right that's balanced uh, with other rights. For example, freedom of speech and privacy are often directly in contradiction. And so which right trumps? And there are many legal decisions looking at the right of privacy in a journalistic con context. When does, an, when does the newspaper have the right to talk about things? When, when can a newspaper talk about Barnaby Joyce's private life and his sex life in the context of a public figure, for example? Uh, so privacy is not absolute. And I'll often have people say to me, ah, but they're relying upon their right of privacy, but there might be another right that trumps pri privacy. Uh, oh, too fast. Really what privacy looks at is who controls information about me? So it's an issue of control. Do I control information about me? Or does Facebook that's gone to a lot of effort to collect information about me and is commercializing it, does it have control of that information? And how do we balance privacy rights with other rights? They're, they're key questions generally for privacy. And if we look at privacy, there are many different aspects. And so to understand the Australian Privacy Act, we have to look at it in context. So there's human rights law. And so if you look at the United Nations Declaration uh, of Human Rights, for example, privacy is one of the human rights that's, that's mentioned. And so there's human rights law. There's constitutional law. And this is particularly big in the United States. And so constitutional law allows a court to invalidate a law passed by parliament or in the US passed by Congress if it, if it breaches someone's privacy rights. And so one of the most famous cases in the United States uh, is Griswold v. Connecticut about Planned Parenthood Center prescribed contraceptives to a married couple. Uh, Connecticut law made it illegal to use contraceptives. So we're not talking about too long ago, this is 1965, so 56 years ago. Uh, it was illegal to use contraceptive and Planned Parenthood was prosecuted for aiding and abetting a criminal offense. And the US Supreme Court struck down that Connecticut law and said, it's an invasion of the married couple's privacy to have a law preventing um, uh, uh, the prescription of contraception or the use of contraception. Uh, then in a later case, uh, it, it was not looking just at married couples, but law preventing the use, the prescription and use of contraceptive by unmarried couples was struck down again on a privacy right. So this is where the court takes the law off the books and says it's in breach of 
uh, breach of the constitution in, in the constitution, at least in the US gives a right of privacy. The most controversial and well-known case in the United States is Roe v. Wade, which is the, the abortion case where the, the court struck down a Texas abortion statute in 1973, again on a right of privacy. And then, uh, uh, and, and that's a, you know, a very political case. B different people have different views of, of that case. And Obama, for example, uh, not so long ago when he was president, again said that that case was based upon a right of privacy. And then we've got the uh, uh, gay marriage cases and gay sex cases where the court, for example, struck down a Texas law uh, that, that made sodomy, sodomy illegal, again, on privacy grounds. And so we have these constitutional cases, at least in the US. There's also a privacy law looking at search and seizure by government. So when, when does a government official, such a as a, a policeman, have a right to come into your house into your, invade your privacy and search you or your house, for example. And then there's government and workplace surveillance. So to what extent can the government uh, 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 record what you're doing? So that's a photograph I took in uh, Shanghai not so long ago, at least before COVID, uh, but uh, not so long before COVID. Of, and ev everywhere in Shanghai, there's cameras. And in Brisbane, for example, it's if you look around, there's, there's many cameras too. So what is the law? in relation to, to doing that in, say, in the workplace or in a public place. So they're all aspects of, of privacy. Another aspect is, is what's called tort law. That's a right to sue someone who invades your privacy. So a famous case from England, for example, is Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michael Douglas got married in the Park Plaza in New York. Someone stuck, snuck in, took a photograph of their wedding and sold it to, a, to Hello Magazine, who published it. Uh, and uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michael Douglas sued personally and recovered money from Hello Magazine and the photographer for invading their privacy, for invading their wedding. Uh, and then there's data privacy, and that's privacy in relation to personal information. And if, if you look at the law in Australia, the privacy, Australian law and the Australian Privacy Act primarily primarily only deals with data privacy. We'll talk about what data privacy means in a minute, but, but primarily that's what uh, uh, the law is, is focused on. We don't have a constitutional right of privacy in Australia, at least not at the moment. So if a law invades your privacy, it can't be struck down. We don't have the right for you to sue someone individually uh, uh, for a breach of your privacy in, in Australia. That, that, doesn't exist. Uh, the Privacy Act doesn't deal with search and seizure, and it doesn't deal directly with surveillance. And so really, Australian privacy law, the Australian Privacy Act is very limited compared to what it could be. And so let's have a look at what it does cover, because a lot of the things I've mentioned so far are not covered by the Privacy Act at all. And so Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michael Douglas got married in Australia and someone in Australia published a photograph of their wedding, they couldn't sue in Australia for breach of privacy. If you found the Queensland law or an Australian federal law that you thought was contrary to your right to privacy, you couldn't have it invalidated by the High Court. That's not covered by Australian Privacy Act or Australian Privacy Law, at least at the present time. And so what does the Privacy Act cover? Well, it's a really a broad principled approach to privacy. And we'll be talking a little bit about the Australian privacy principles. And so they talk about high level principles rather than uh, uh, very black and white rules. And many times, particularly in the health context and the medical context, the rules are open to interpretation. Uh, the government calls it a light touch approach. When they brought the law in, there was pushback from business. And so it's a, it's a light touch approach to privacy. And the Waiver Privacy Act operates as it covers all personal information and a subset of personal information is health information and particular rules apply to health information. I'm gonna talk mostly at the higher level about personal information 
because health information is a subset of personal information. So all the rules that apply to personal information will also apply to health information, plus there's a few additional rules. And we'll talk about those rules as we, as we go along. And so the Privacy Act applies to the federal government, uh, but not ASIO or the court. So it doesn't apply to people who are spying on you uh, and larger businesses. It doesn't apply to the state government. There are separate state privacy laws that are different to the federal privacy laws, similar but different. And each state has different privacy laws as well. And so state hospitals are not covered by the Federal Privacy Act in many circumstances, but the state privacy act, depending upon the context. Uh, doesn't apply to small businesses, except if it's a business providing health services that holds health information, and then it applies regardless of size. So a small restaurant is not governed by the Privacy Act, but a small doctor's surgery is covered by the Privacy Act. Uh, it doesn't apply to political parties. There's limited application to the media. It only applies to records. So oral unrecorded conversations are not captured. There's a special exemption for employee records, which is quite narrow. And the primary focus of the Privacy Act is personal information. So the question is, what is personal information? And so personal information is information or an opinion about an identified individual or about an individual who's reasonably identified. And it's irrelevant whether the information is true or not. Public information can be personal information. So, there's a, so we're not talking about confidential information here. Uh, we're talking about information about a person, regardless of whether it's public or not. And so privacy law, the Australian Privacy Act aims at allowing individuals to control how information about them is made public. And once it's made public, for, it's still personal information and privacy law still applies. So that's the, the overall, um, uh, the, the Privacy Act focuses on personal information and control of personal information. We'll see how that control happens, but let's just look at a little bit more detail of, of personal information. And so there's some obvious examples of personal information. So a person's name and address or email or their medical records or where they work or how much they earn or what they have in their bank account or what car you drive or what health insurance company you use. That's all information about a person. It also covers uh, what you might like or your opinions or opinions about you or information on your Facebook or what searches you might, someone might do on a website or recordings made of a person speaking, such as in a call center, or uh, if someone's recording you by a tape recorder. They're all examples of personal information. So, uh, but some things are not personal information. So the fact that the Royal Brisbane Hospital has 320 beds, that's actually not true, but if that was true, that's not personal information because it's information about a hospital, not about a person. Or the house at Smith Street has a swimming pool, this is information about a house, not a person. So the Privacy Act doesn't apply to that. But if you also record that Mrs. Nelson lives at 20 Smith Street, then that's information about Mrs. Nelson. It's Mrs. Nelson lives in a house with a swimming pool. That's personal information. But the, if, it, if you just recorded that the house at 20 Smith Street had a pool and you didn't know who, who owned that house, that's not personal information and not covered by the Privacy Act. And so in... Uh, in the research context, often information is de-identified and aggregated or, or, or aggregated. And then, and then it stops being personal information. So if we had person Z has lung cancer, if that's all we knew, that's not about an individual because no one knows who person Z is. If I said that person Z was male, that still doesn't tell you who person Z is. Now, if I said that person Z is the CEO of Facebook, then most people know who the CEO of Facebook is, and then that does become personal information. If I said 60% of the people who live at Eagle Farm like to eat bananas, well, then that's not about any person because no person's reasonably identified. And you couldn't determine if someone, if any particular person liked to eat bananas from that fact. If I said 100% of female premiers like rugby league, that, that is personal information because there's only one female premier of of Queen, uh, one female premier who's a premier of Queensland. And so that, that would be personal information. So, it's, so there's 
so often when de-identifying and aggregating information, you have to make sure that it can't be re-identified so that you can look at it and you might think you've done a job de-identifying it so that the Privacy Act doesn't apply, but in fact, it can be re-identified. Um, as I mentioned before, personal information is different to confidential information. So your name and address and telephone number in a telephone directory is still personal information. It doesn't have to be correct. So if we said Scott Morrison lives in Brisbane and works at McDonald's, and in fact, if I was referring to the prime minister, we know that's not correct. It's still personal information. And it can have more than one subject matter. So I said Jack and Jill are married. That's personal information about Jill. It's also personal information about Jack. And so that's what the Privacy Act deals with. It deals with personal information. Uh, and there are a number of privacy principles, what's called the Australian Privacy Principles, or APPs that say how uh, personal information must be handled. And they deal with collection, use, disclosure, sending that information outside Australia, and Tom mentioned that just before, uh, accuracy, security, and correction. And so uh, really you could say dealing with control of personal information. And we'll have a look briefly at some of these APPs. And so collection is the first one. The rule says you can only collect personal information if it's necessary to do so and to achieve a legitimate, billful, a legitimate and lawful business purpose. So don't collect irrelevant personal information or information that's not useful. It must only be collected by lawful and fair means. And you must collect it directly from the individual concerned if that's possible. You don't have to do that if it's unreasonable or impractical, but ideally you should be collecting information about me from me, unless it's unreasonable or impractical to do so. And so when you're collecting information, you should determine the reason you're collecting it and only collect information to achieve that, that, that purpose. So don't collect information about a group when you really only want information about one person. Don't collect information that's unnecessary today in case you might need it in the future. Don't collect information by trick, trickery or at a weed hour or from a person who's in shock. Don't misrepresent why you're collecting the information and don't collect it from a third party if you can collect it directly from the subject person. I've sort of summarized that, the collection rules for you very briefly. That's a two hour course at the university we're talking about this. So we're doing this at whirlwind pace. Um, consent is very important, as you know. Uh, generally, you don't need consent of a person to collect information about that person. But if you're collecting sensitive personal information, you do need consent. So if you're collecting information that says, I like bananas, you don't need my consent to collect it. But if you're collecting information that says, I have lung cancer about me, then you do need my consent because that's sensitive personal information. The categories of sensitive personal information include health information plus other, other things. And so for the majority of personal information, you don't need consent to collect it, but for health information, you do. And so there are special rules for healthcare providers about consent. It could be expressed consent, such as signing a consent form or implied. So if a doctor, you see, if, a doc, if you're in a doctor's office and he says, uh, can you tell me how you feel? And you see the doctor taking notes. Well, you've in effect given implied consent in that circumstance. But you don't always need to get consent. There are exceptions if it's required by law, uh, if it's necessary to provide a healthcare service and you're following rules set by a competent health or medical body, or it's necessary to prevent serious threat to life, health or safety, and it's not practical to get consent. So if I've been involved in an accident and I'm passed out, you don't have to get consent if you want to contact, say, my doctor or my wife and ask her information about me. If you do collect personal information, you have to take reasonable steps to notify the person that you're collecting information and why you're collecting it. Uh, and, and, there's rule, I just jumped ahead, and there's rules about, uh, about doing that, having a privacy and policy, policy and so on. Um, if you collect information about me from someone else, 
you must take reasonable steps to notify me that you've collected this information. Many people don't follow this. In relation to medical information, it's easy because you often get to the notification when you're getting the consent. But in many circumstances, that's not the case. Uh, now we move on to use of personal information. You can only use information for the purpose for which it was collected or with consent or for a purpose that's related to why it's correct, collected. So if you're collecting someone's address to deliver a package and they don't pay, you can also use that the address for debt recovery purposes because that's related to delivery of the package. Uh, so don't collect personal information for one purpose and use it for another purpose. That's not allowed. Uh, you must make sure that the information you have is accurate, up-to-date and complete. You shouldn't rely upon old information. You should only try to collect current information. Uh, if a person provides you with new information, you should update your records and you shouldn't rely upon old information. Security is important. You must take reasonable steps to protect personal information you have in your possession from mis misuse, unauthorized access and loss. And so all the stuff that Tom was talking about is very important if you've got personal information. And if there's a data breach, you might have to notify the federal government. And that data breach might not just be hacking, it might be emailing customer details to the wrong customer or emailing patient details to the wrong person or misplacing a flash drive with, with patient details on it or look, having someone look over your shoulder if you've got information on your screen. Uh, people have right, so customers and patients have a legal right to access personal information you hold about them. But you have to make sure you're disclosing information to the right person. So if I call up and pretend to be my son, you shouldn't disclose information to me about my son. He, he's over 18 uh, uh, because you should only disclose it to him unless he consents. Uh, and so you should also take care when you're making records about someone they might have a right to see it. So I saw one re recently where someone wrote in a, in a record, this person's a real buffhead, and that person asked to see it and they're able to see, to see that, so not very helpful. And so Stacey, do we have time for case studies? I've got about four case studies, which I can do in about four minutes and then I can finish. Or... Well, we do have a couple of questions. So I wonder, John, if you might like to just have a quick look at those. Um, First, if that's okay, um, Joanne has asked, do you need to obtain consent in writing or is verbal consent and case noted sufficient? Yeah, verbal consent and case noted is, is sufficient. Most people will ask people to sign a consent form just so that there's no dispute. And sometimes people, you click online if it's an online collection, but verbal consent is, is sufficient. Excellent. Thank you. That was a... Nice, neat answer. <laughs> in counselling, clients will talk about their partners. And obviously in this sector, we, a lot of therapeutic uh, services happening um, and lots of service provision where our clients or service users will be speaking to us about the, their family members and the people around them. So Joanne's also asked, in counselling, if clients talk to us about their partners or other family members, are we obliged to inform those people that we then have information about them? But that's a really tricky one in the in the health context. So in the general, if I was collecting financial information, for example, then then uh, the answer is if it's reasonable, you should notify the other person. Uh, health information, it gets more tricky because it might be unreasonable to notify someone. So if it, because it might put someone's it might put the person you're notifying's health in danger or have an adverse health effect, or it might put your patient's health in danger. And so it gets much more tricky as to what you should be doing there. Uh, and I think the practice would be, like if you asked me, what do I feel about my wife and I told you stuff and you made a note, I think it would be unusual for you, for you to then have to call up my wife and say, uh, John thinks this of you. That wouldn't be helpful to, to, the, to the therapy and it wouldn't be appropriate. Mm. And so, uh, but it, it gets tricky if my wife then does a Privacy Act request and says, what information do you have about me? That gets very tricky. And there's some very, it's, 
it's not black and white. So that's a much more difficult question than the first Yeah, one. and I think, you know, this is some of the, those complexities around what information we do record and how we record it is some of the things that Lindsay was going to delve into in his session. So for everyone on the line who was um, wanting some information around actual that practical case note writing and what implications that might have, um, Lindsay will be recording something for the group and, and sending it out later. So um, we, will, we will have um, some more opportunity for discussion around that. Um, John, Simone has uh, asked a question and um, it's, if a not-for-profit in Queensland receives funding from Queensland state government, um, whoops, it's just scrolled, and not federal, but has a turnover of more than 3 million, is she right in assuming that the Privacy Act and the Information Privacy Act for Queensland would be applicable? Yeah, so if you've got a business with a turnover of more than 3 million, uh, should you should be captured by the Queensland Privacy Act, unless you're a Queensland GOC. So if you're a state government owned corporation. So if we look at Q Super, for example, I think that's Queensland government owned. And so it's subject to the Queensland Act rather than the federal act, I think. Uh, but it could also be that both the federal and the state act apply. So if you if, so if you're a uh, if you've got turnover of more than three million, but you're doing contract work for the state government, the state act might apply as well as the federal act. So you could have both of them applying. Right. So it sometimes leads to confusion. Yes, I can see that would be the case. Hopefully that that made things clear for you, Simone. But I, I'm sorry, seem to have run out of time for the case studies. I'm sorry, John. But um, we will um, be sending out your slides to everyone very soon um, after this event. Nope, no problem at all. And so that, that was a summary of 26 hours of privacy law in, in 26 minutes. So, so I'm sure that it's really just a, an alert to some of the issues. So. Thanks very much, John. Mon, I might ask for you to just summarise now, thanks. Uh, yes, we are coming online. That's it. Um, and we're on. Uh, okay, so we are at time, everybody. And that wraps up and concludes today's session. We've had such interesting presentations. John, thank you so very much for um, the, the rapid fire tour of privacy law. Um, and you got to the heart of some of those really thorny issues and complexities. So uh, it's really terrific that we're able to get those questions to you as well. Um, so it's really uh, just to close off the session, there will be some further information uh, what we are able to provide uh, that was shown today, we'll send through in our post-event email. Uh, we're just following up on the recording to see that we can do that as well. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who stuck with it. It's a long journey, three hours in front of a screen. So you've done very, very well. And um, yeah, I think, I really hope it's been very useful. As um, Stacey uh, said at the beginning, it's really a springboard for further conversations. And I know that the quality collaboration network is uh, in a bit of a planning headspace at the moment to try and think about what useful uh, themes and topics they're going to address uh, in 2022. Um, just while uh, you're completing that poll on the screen there, I'm just going to let, let Beck have um, the final word for this morning. Thank yeah, you. I just wanted to thank you all for joining us today. Um, it is a really interesting topic it doesn't sound all that interesting but there's so many considerations that you need to know about and when you sort of bring it all together it's um a, a lot to go through so like um monica and stacy said we're going to be having further conversations about this next year this is sort of just the springboard to um get deeper into some of these issues um and work out how i guess the sector can be best supported in dealing with all these um, privacy issues. Um, and just also wanted to thank all our presenters today, sharing your expertise. Um, you're all absolutely fantastic and really, really appreciate your time. And one final thing, there were some questions that we weren't able to get to in the chat. So let's take those on notice and uh, QCOS at this end will do what we can to 
uh, help you find the answers to those questions. And we might liaise offline with some of our panelists about them. Yak couldn't be here right until the very end, but I noticed that Tom, you're still online. So another shout out and thank you to you, uh, John and Tim, who was with us earlier. So that's it, everybody. Uh, uh, go and earn yourselves a, a nice lunch break and have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, everyone.